Hey everyone, I'm Travis Wright, and you're listening to I'm a Fan Of, your show for music, comedy, and more. As always, if you're a musician, a comedian, or just someone that does something interesting, please reach out to me on Instagram at Travis Can Listen. You can find me on Facebook at I'm a Fan Of, or you can reach out to me through the website at I'm a Fan of Pod.com. Of course, if you just enjoy the show, please follow me there as well and like and subscribe to the podcast. This episode, we have stand up comic Denise Lee in for an interview. She is very funny. Originally here from North Texas, she grew up in Richardson or at least lived in Richardson for a while. And then um, she moved to California, San Francisco specifically. And that's actually where she started her comedy career. But she comes back to town to visit family and whatnot, and she does some shows here. So I've had the pleasure of watching her uh, multiple times now uh, at different stages here in DFW. I think she's very funny. She's relatively new in her comedy career, but I think she's going to be extremely funny moving forward. So uh, please go check her out on social media. Go give her a follow. Make sure you check out a show, whether you're in California or Texas. She's going to be performing there um, as well as I think she gets out a little bit around there, um, away from there as well and performs. So uh, be sure to keep an eye on her. I think she's going to be very, very funny. But for now, please enjoy this interview. The I'm a Fan of Podcast. Music, comedy, and more. Denise Lee. Yes, welcome. hello. Thank you so How much are you? for having me. I am well. How are you? I'm good. I know so little about you. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I would be creeped out if you knew more. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> no, 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 no. There's not a lot. Well, yeah, we were talking yeah. a little bit. I saw you, um, man, I don't know how long ago it was, but you were on a uh, one of the Addison Improv, the Anne Friend shows, I think, when you were yeah, back here in town. Yeah, it was like maybe like John Brown or Emily like Griefer. I think it was, was Emily Griefer. Oh, that yeah. was such a fun show. Yeah, that was yeah. super fun. And so you're from here originally. Yes. From I'm where? From Richardson. Richardson. And then yeah, you're now yeah. in the Bay Area. I, yes. Now I live in San Francisco. Okay. So. What moved yeah. you to San Francisco? Uh, after after college. Mm-hmm. Um, so I yeah, I grew up um, born and raised in Richardson. And then I went to college in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my job just brought me out to the Bay Area. Okay. So work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I didn't know anything about like comedy until maybe like two years ago. Oh, basically. so you started in the Bay Area? Yeah, I started in oh, the Bay Area, but it okay. was interesting because like so I started um, almost two years ago, mm-hmm. um, and I started in San Francisco, but um, I had a trip back here planned at the time. Mm-hmm. So actually, my second open mic ever was in Dallas. It was at oh, Backdoor cool. Comedy Club. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a great yeah. one too. I know it really. Yeah. It set the expectations a little too high for open <laughs> mics. I was like, oh, they're all like this. Yeah. So you've only done this for about two years now? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. You seem very comfortable on stage. Oh, thank you. It's all it's all a facade. It's all fake. <laughs> <laughs> you still get well last night though, you were at a sold out show doing doing yeah. what did you do? Like ten minutes last night? I did seven minutes. Seven, seven minutes. minutes. But it was it was good and it was like a great, yeah. great lineup. Um I So did with, you still feel super nervous going up on that one? Honestly, Actually, the more people there are, yeah. the less nervous I feel just because I feel like if there's more people, I'm like the percentage of people that want to laugh at my jokes is higher. Yeah. Whereas if there is only like 20 people at a show, I'm like, oh, man, if 15 mm. of them aren't into it, then it's like super clear. So yeah. I prefer the bigger audiences, actually. My wife and I were sitting in the corner next to a group of your friends because you oh. came over to talk to your friends. Oh, that was my sister. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. And I was, I, you know, we don't know each other. And I was like, oh, I'm going to say hi to her. But then I always get weirded out that I'm going to, that like, you know, don't bother people before their show. You oh, know? Like, no, no, no. Oh, I, okay. I, yeah. It's, my wife's always like, just talk to people. Don't think that way. And I was like, I don't know what their process is. I you mean, know? That's, that's nice of you. <laughs> I feel like some people, yeah, like to like be super in the zone for yeah. me. Like, um, yeah, for me, it's usually pretty okay. Mm-hmm. Um, last night was a little bit interesting because, yeah, it was my sister's first time ever seeing me do comedy. Ooh. So that did make me a little bit What nervous. made you invite her to that show then? Um, Were you ready for family to watch you? Yeah, so my dad had gone to the second open mic I ever did in Richardson because he drove me because I can't drive. And so <laughs> wait, I was wait, like, wait, 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 wait. what do you mean you can't drive? So I have a license, uh-huh. but I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so I took I took driving lessons at a driving school, and I distinctly remember I was maybe three fourths of the way through the course, and the instructor was like, "You should not be behind the wheel." Really? And she was right. I was really bad. I was really bad. She took me on the highway and then like two seconds and she was like, get off. I was like, yeah, that's mm. totally fair. Was this the normal like 15, 16 years old that you're learning all this? No. So I actually learned at like 18 because 18? Okay. I had no social life. So there was I, I didn't even want to drive, but mm. I was like, oh, 
it's necessary for identification. <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, then, but nobody told you you could just get an ID. You didn't have to have no, a license. No, yeah, I thought I yeah. had to get a license. Oh, that's hilarious. So you're like, I have to pass this test because they yeah. say I have to have ID. And yeah. I studied for the driving test, uh-huh. which I don't think people normally do. Like my dad took me to the DMV like a, mm-hmm. the weekend before when no one was there. And we practiced the routes around there. So I learned just to what drive. What do you mean? Like the DMV track? Yeah, yeah. Just like the oh. neighborhoods around there. Um, like their specific like parallel parking thing. And I was like, so I just nailed just that neighborhood. <laughs> <How to drive. laughs> I had a totally different driving experience. First of all, how old are you? I'm 29. 29. So I'm yeah. 38. And uh, I had a totally different driving experience. I grew up in a really small town, uh-huh. and I got my learner's permit at 15. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, we didn't have any cops out there, yeah, so yeah. we were just, like, driving oh. all the time. And uh, since there's no police out there, it's like when I was probably, like, 12 or 13, yeah. we already kind of started driving our parents' cars wow. with our parents in it. That's so brave. And then, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they do now, but we had a... Um, we had the option, like I didn't take any driving classes. Mm-hmm. I didn't take a DMV test. Oh, it just came to you naturally. Well, no, no, no. Like we had this other thing where they're like, they gave you a log and they were like, yeah, your parents will teach you and oh. y'all just check off what you did. And that was it. So I didn't have to, I did a written driver's test, yeah. but I didn't actually have to actually prove that I could drive. Oh, anyone. that's so interesting. But I know that if I had to, even though I felt like I could drive well, yeah. well enough anyway for like yeah. a 16 year old. I think I would be terrified to be in front of an instructor driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like driving in front of a cop when you've had a couple beers, you know? Right. Like, you're, a little, you're a little worried, like, oh, God, I'm going right. to ruin my life. Exactly, exactly. And, like, I was already, like, not wanting to drive. I was like, I have nowhere to go. This is unnecessary. Mm. So I was just like, yeah, the instructor wasn't into it. I wasn't into it. And it was all good. <laughs> wow. So how did, yeah. how did the test actually go? It went well. I aced it because yeah. I practiced the route before. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, but I'm a great theoretical driver. I, <laughs> I aced the driving test. I can tell you exactly how to do it. Exactly. I was like, I can memorize every all the rules. I just can't execute. What do you feel like makes you so bad at driving? What is it? I think it's the lack of confidence, actually. It's a persistent theme through my life. But give me, um, an, give me an example, though. When you're driving, what are you doing that makes you a bad driver? So I do not know how to merge <laughs> okay, that's a very important one. That's an important one. I know. And I'm like So the highway's terrifying. Oh, haven't driven on the highway since driving classes. Really? But even on normal roads, like I I can drive and I'll drive out here if I have to, but I will pick like off peak hours when oh, I wow. don't really have to change lanes yeah. or try and merge. So I just like get too nervous. It's like kind of like when you're talking to someone and you're like or, like, you don't want to, like, interrupt something that they're saying, but you're trying to find, like, the the right place to do it. This is how you feel about the merge. Yes. Oh, my God. I overthink it way too much. So when you're a passenger, are you equally as terrified? Oh, no. I just, I just ignore. You're good to go. Yeah, Because exactly. I'm a very confident driver. Like, I'm one of those yeah. where it's like, I know how much room I have, and I'm very just, like, I'll merge right you in front of you, and in. we're good to go. Yeah. And uh, I, would, I worry that, that uh, I don't know, I'm probably a little bit of a jerk driver. Like, I don't cut people off, yeah. but I just, I'm one of those where it's like, if neither of us are making a move, we're going to get into an accident. Yeah. So I'm going to make the move. You, you assert know? yourself. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I'm very passive. I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know what? You're right. You should keep you going. You should go. <laughs> yeah. And then I just keep waiting. <laughs> and eventually and then... <laughs> you just stop and pull over in the right lane and you're like, I just, I'm giving up. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'll like just turn into like an empty like shopping center or something and just sit for a while no. to collect myself. It gets you that worked up? <laughs> or just like until there's like less cars sure. and I'm like, okay. Now, now it's my time to go back out there. What's the longest you've ever sat somewhere to collect yourself or until the traffic died down? Oh, not that long. Maybe like maybe like 15 minutes. Oh my God. I thought you were about to be like, I don't know, like four hours. <laughs> no, and okay. it was because it was like raining and I didn't okay. know how to operate the back windshield wipers. Okay, that's reasonable though. Yeah, and I was like, I should have, I should have, I should have learned this. <laughs> I commend you though for knowing you're a terrible driver. Yeah, you know what I mean. Because exactly. I feel like a lot of people do not know they're horrible at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's nice out in San. I live in San Francisco. Yeah, you really don't need to drive there, do you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's nice to have a car because then you can kind of like get out of San Francisco. Um, but. It's yeah, you don't have to have a car mm-hmm. in the city, but it is it is helpful, especially like with comedy and stuff. It's easier yeah. to get around. Was that did that help sway your decision to move out there? The fact that like, oh, I don't need to rely on a car as much. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Your, your Uber bills and everything have to be ridiculous around here. 
Yeah, they're all right. My dad drives me. Okay, the is that who dropped you off today? Yeah. No way. We had dinner before this, oh. and I was and like, "You didn't introduce me to." You. Oh God, no! I was Why like, not? "No one should." No one. I was like, "No one should see this." Well, good thing you didn't <laughs> come on a podcast and tell everyone. <laughs> First of all, how sweet of a dad! To I drive know. You over. I bet he loves it though, right? He really does. Earlier today, we were driving to dinner, so we got dinner with my sister um, and my brother-in-law and my niece. Um, Um, And we were driving to dinner and he was like, I just love driving with you. And I was completely silent the whole ride. And I was like, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. But I think from his perspective, it's more of like a safety thing because he was like, Mm. I would rather like go out of my way to drive her than like think about whether our minivan is going to get wrecked tonight. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, and like the little bit you talked about your family and your stand up, it's like I get the sense that it's a tight family. It's a tight family. Um, I think uh, it's definitely gotten like more tight knit like through the years, Mm -hmm. Um, especially. uh, So my sister used to live out in the Bay Area as well, um, which was another reason I kind of wanted to move out here. But Mm -hmm. she moved back uh, to Dallas to start a family and stuff. Uh, And so I have a niece now. She's two and a half years old now mm-hmm. um and so like i feel like she really helps like bring everyone together that's so, so nice. that's nice yeah. yeah your dad's just dropping you off my dad just dropping me off not my mom my mom doesn't know how to drive highways either really <laughs> yeah. well when did they when did they immigrate here you said they're from taiwan they're, right they're from taiwan they immigrated here maybe like 35 years ago or so. oh wow okay so how old yeah. do you think she would have been do you know oh my gosh i think she was maybe like 30 like 30. just a little bit older than i am now which is insane to yeah. me because yeah. yeah i just had this guy uh, alfred kaingo on here he immigrated from zimbabwe oh cool and uh but that's like an english speaking you know he knew english when he came yeah. here and so did your parents know english no well, well my dad kind of did because my bit. dad came to school here okay. um, but my mom didn't so my mom just followed him that's so, so crazy though could you imagine moving somewhere where you don't know the language oh, right now god no and, and this is pre-internet pre-cell phone yeah and just having a child too so my sister is like wow. six years older than me and they like i think they were here for maybe like two years before they had her but still i'm like yeah, I can't imagine nuts. that. Yeah, but my dad speaks English like fairly well, but my mom speaks like almost no English. I think it's also a yeah. confidence thing where like she knows more English than she thinks she does. Is she one of those where she understands a ton of it, but she's just not great at speaking it? I don't it, even or? know if she understands a lot mm. of it. She definitely understands like basics, yeah. um, but kind of like um, like in one of my jokes, I talk about how she like doesn't yeah, know yeah, what that's I'm what talking I was thinking about of. Yeah. at all. Yeah, it's like she couldn't under, she wouldn't be able to like really understand like stand up mm. comedy, yeah. you know, so, um, so, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does she like living here, not knowing the language very well? So it's interesting because there's actually a huge Taiwanese population mm-hmm. um, in the Dallas area. So she really likes it because she can honestly like get by like most of her life like wow. without knowing any. English. When you say Dallas, though, are you talking more Richardson or just Richardson Plano area? Richardson Plano is like crazy diverse yeah and people don't realize it yeah 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 richardson plano garland yeah. even yeah. yeah 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 we uh i used to live close to that area and um it's like we used to go over there just for restaurants oh yeah you know what i mean because there's oh, all like if you want to find any kind of little cultural restaurant that's yeah. kind of where it is and there are all these great little hidden gems you yeah know? yeah garland for vietnamese food mm. plano for chinese food yeah Richardson for whatever. For whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My wife and I, we live here in East Dallas, but we always oh, cool. thought if we were going to move out of Dallas proper, mm-hmm. Richardson's probably the only place we would go. Yeah. I love it, it over there. It's it's nice. And it's like, honestly, it's it's pretty cheap, I think, compared to a lot of other areas of Dallas. Yeah. Now. I just like those old neighborhoods, too. Yeah, like the yeah, big yeah. trees and, you know, yeah. you can't buy that. Like, you can't buy a brand new home with a big tree. Oh, no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, those don't exist anymore. How did it compare when you moved from Richardson to San Francisco? Oh my gosh, it was it was pretty wild. So first of all, San Francisco is like insanely expensive. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I had to get used to like being poor out there. <laughs> um, I was yeah. like, oh, poverty's an adventure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> At first, you're just like, this is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, I was. Yeah, I had like all these little like life hacks. So I would eat like canned tuna every day, but uh-huh. wrap it in like dried seaweed, and I was like, oh, mm, it's sushi. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so so there was that um 
But also it was interesting to like not be able to like drive there because mm. like I did have to or I do have to like walk or like take public transit and actually like helped me get to know the city like a lot more mm -hmm. um, versus like, you know, I lived in Richardson for 18 years, Houston for four years. And I feel like I still don't know those these cities like super well just because you're kind of just driving from like point A to point B. I get you. Yeah. 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 So. yeah I uh I enjoy it makes me think of your set last night because first of all, you asked if anybody ran and no. everyone was dead silent. I was like no one and I, I like to run. But you were too shy. I was too shy because nobody was saying anything and yeah. I was like, I'm not gonna be the one person that's like, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because like in San Francisco, so many people are like, Woo, running and I come back to Texas yeah. and that was my first time doing the joke in Texas and yeah. I didn't know how it would go and I was like, Yeah, it makes sense that no one in Texas is into running. <laughs> I could see that's the genuine fair. surprise. I was like oh, There was like wow. a surprise, but then an immediate realization like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah, I was like, not. oh, this is where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I like running. I've done a couple marathons. Oh, that's and, awesome. Uh, and even in my little neighborhood, it's like when you're training for those marathons, you'll do like 10, 15 mile runs for yeah. the training. And so you run out of, there's not like a lot of good places. You don't want to just go around a track, God, right? No, no, And no. so you just start running through neighborhoods and yeah. you start running out and, of, of spots to go. So you go to new places. Yeah. And uh, it's similar to that, the, you know, walking. It's like you really do see and experience so much more. Yeah. Be, something about being in that car. It's like you just get tunnel vision for the road. Right. 100%. You're not really checking stuff out. And now yeah. I feel like I know all these little spots in our neighborhood. Oh, that's and, you so know, nice. it's, yeah, it's so much more fun. Yeah, yeah. And so I totally get that. I yeah. would love to be in a walkable neighborhood. You know, yeah. I mean, a, like walk to work kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I walk to work. It's like a 25 minute walk. Mm -hmm. And that's it's pretty nice. I have to walk through some rough neighborhoods. Yeah. I, I heard you one of your bits talking about the Tenderloin. Oh, the galloping, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is exactly. Is that, th is that your route to work? <laughs> yes. I literally have to <laughs> go through the That place was dangerous like 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> is it still as dangerous it's as it used pretty, to be? Um, I shouldn't say dangerous, but it is sketchy. It's sketch. It's a sketchy area. Yeah, you definitely have to be aware. Yeah. Um, I think that, like, it's not as dangerous as people think it is mm -hmm. um, in terms of, like, your, like, safety. But it's definitely, like, kind of weird because there's just, like, a lot of, like, drugs and violence mm -hmm. going on. But it's usually people, like, with who kind of, like live there versus you like just stroll on through you stroll on through i remember once i was like walking to an open mic that again i had to walk through the tenderloin to get to mm -hmm. and uh, and i remember i was like i had like pepper spray in one hand and i was just like <laughs> hunched over <laughs> like waddling along and then some lady from like the side of the street yells out i don't want anything from you anyway and i was like <laughs> I'm offended, but yeah. also that's nice. You you're know? like, thank you, but fuck you. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, do I not look like I have assets? I was like, uh -huh. you're right. I don't, but. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. I mean, do you not feel, because uh, if you're going to open mics, this is in the evening. This is nighttime, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, you don't feel very, like, you don't get super concerned. Something might happen. Um, I, I, I like asking this question to women yeah. because there's definitely a big distinction, right? Like, yeah. I don't feel like as many people could overpower me. Yeah. So I naturally walk with a little less fear. Yeah. And it, it kind of dawned on me a couple of years ago. Uh, well, our son's three. Uh -huh. So it kind of dawned on me of like, oh my gosh, like if somebody just wanted to hurt my wife, it's like yeah. they could, you yeah, know, and yeah, it gets yeah. more scary. Mm -hmm. And it, it finally hit me of like, oh, that's how it is for women to walk a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. But you're just strolling on through. and Yeah, I mean, there is definitely like a little bit of like, anxiety and just like kind of like on edge mm -hmm. but honestly i think i'm like pretty oblivious which is maybe a bad thing <laughs> yeah. but like i just don't see like sketchy things happening mm -hmm. on the side and i just like walk quickly um and knock on wood so far it's been okay um but also like you know if it's like super late at night and it's like 1 a.m mm -hmm. then i'm like all right i'm gonna like take an uber home gotcha versus i'm like okay it's like 8 p.m there's like other people out and about and if someone is around me and they look more I guess, robbable than me. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, you just walk first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the other thing, too. I like, even though that lady did offend me, I was like, I really don't look like there's a lot you could take from me. I was like, you could take my phone. Yeah. But I'm like, it's not a lot of bang for your buck. I'm like, you might as well go for someone else. <laughs> you got to work on like a crazy face. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to yeah. work on something. With, I used to live in a rough neighborhood. Um, it's like when I realized an apartment could be too cheap. Yeah. Um, oh, 100%. I had this two bedroom, two bathroom apartment here in Dallas. It was off. Oh. Oh, luxury. It was off. Well, it was off of uh, 
near like Greenville Avenue and 635. Okay. But it, in but there's a little side street called Markville. I don't know what uh-huh. it's like now, but back then it was like sketchy all the time. Uh-huh. And um, there was this racetrack gas station. At the time I was waiting tables and it's like every now and then I would forget to get gas before I went oh, to work. No. So I'd have to pull in at like two in the morning. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing like a uniform. Yeah. I've got cash in my pocket because yeah. I'm later and I'm like, I'm so robbable right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And I would just get kind of like the widest like crazy looking eyes and I had a pocket knife on me always. Oh, wow. So I would just stand there with crazy eyes, pumping gas, just holding an open knife. Like, what are your crazy eyes? <laughs> like, if I was pumping gas, I would just be like this, just kind of wide-eyed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, if you walked up, I would just be like... Yeah. Just kind of, like, don't fucking... I don't want to talk about anything, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because people would. They'd be like, hey, man, uh, can I talk to you? And I'd just be like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and funny. I'm, and I'm just holding, like, an open knife. Yeah, And it's yeah. like, I don't know that I would actually ever stab anybody. I don't think I could do that. Yeah, yeah. But I just needed the facade of, like... Oh, 100%. You know, yeah. I don't... I've never used my pepper spray before. Yeah. Never even tried it. I just mm-hmm. hope that if I have to use it one day... It just comes to me. But yeah. yeah, I'm like, I don't think I would really use it. Have you ever it. practiced just spraying it? No, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, when I was a little kid, when I was like in middle school, we found somebody's pepper spray and we were so stupid. We just wanted to see how it sprayed. Mm-hmm. And we're so dumb. We didn't realize we were in like a small room like this. Oh, yeah. So we sprayed it like at the wall and then the fumes just fill up. Oh, the room. my so gosh. We're all just cock- so we, yeah. we pepper sprayed ourselves. So you were like, it works. Yeah. Oh, it was horrible. It yeah. was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's, it, it was fun, like, to know how it works, but right. all that stuff, I don't know. I've gotten so paranoid with a wife and a kid Yeah, about, I never saw this stuff before, yeah. but now I worry about them. And now I, I've i shifted to, like, uh, I don't want to ever have to defend anything. It's yeah. like, let's just avoid the problem. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's kind of how, like, my dad's philosophy mm-hmm. is, where he's, like, if it's like a dangerous night to like go out, just don't go out. I like your dad. I feel like we'd get along. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, all we hear in Texas uh-huh. is that California is a hellish apocalyptic landscape. A little bit. Yeah. Is it really? <laughs> what, tell me what's exaggerated and tell me what's um, not. There is a lot of poop in the streets. I have heard about this, that you guys actually have an app to report poop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My neighborhood has so much poop. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, God. yeah. It's like to the point where sometimes like I'm so used to seeing poop now that sometimes when I see poop on the streets, I just feel jealous. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like why are they so healthy and regular? <laughs> why am I not? You need to get on that homeless diet. I was like, what are they eating? Yeah. I was like, that is so much fiber, whatever it is. Um, oh, my gosh. So <laughs> That much, though? Have you? Okay. It's not like all the time, but there yeah. are like enough to where you're like, Jesus, this is a lot of poop. Yeah, I'm just like, that is impressive. <laughs> I'm like, that, yeah, I'm like, that needs a modern toilet to flush down. Mm, <laughs> um, a yeah. uh, lot of needles everywhere, like mm-hmm. drug problem is drug usage is, I think, like a big problem. Um, I don't know. What else? What else do people say about California? Uh, well, I mean, I, you, those are kind of the big heavy hitters, just the homeless problem, needles, yeah. you know, public defecation, that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, you talked about being poor. Everything's just too expensive out there. Yeah. But it, it kind of makes me sad to know that that is happening in San Francisco because, like, I grew up, we were watching, like, Full House. Oh, and it's yeah. like San Francisco is, like, this beautiful place in California. Yeah. And I went probably in 2000. Last time I was there was probably like 2005 or six. Yeah. And uh, there was nothing really like that. It was a beautiful city. Yeah. And it's hard for me to imagine that mm-hmm. it's like that. But I also, you know, it's like you're here in Texas. You don't know what's exaggerated because yeah. people here are like, don't California my Texas and yeah. all that. And, well, also there's like different neighborhoods mm-hmm. in San Francisco too. It's almost like little micro cities. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely still neighborhoods in San Francisco that are super nice. Um but those are but, unattainable now, right? Like crazy expensive. Oh, super expensive. unattainable in terms of like who can live there. But mm-hmm. like I feel like if you're like a tourist visiting San Francisco, if you stick to like certain neighborhoods, you could really like go a whole trip without like seeing like any of like mm. the other stuff. Yeah. Um, well, how do you feel as somebody who lives there now? Like to you, is it like, I love it here. I don't care about this stuff. Or does it bother you? Um, on it, it bothers me a little bit, but I kind of understand it like i think it's more of like a i i think it's like it points to like a bigger like societal problem right like there's just like such a big like gap Mm -hmm. in wealth 
Um, and I think it's like, you know, like it's definitely not ideal, but it definitely shows like, hey, like this is actually like a bigger problem that like the government like needs to address or like we need to do something about. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more like thinking about like that larger like structural change versus like, ah, like I'm annoyed at like these individual yeah. people. Um, I think that, like the thing for me is like I like San Francisco, but um, it's a very like transient city. Like I feel like not a lot of people settle down there. Right. Um, it's definitely harder now knowing how yeah. real estate is is there. Yeah. A lot of people come try it for a few years mm-hmm. and it, you just can't afford anything. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and I think especially people who are like interested in like pursuing comedy, like mm-hmm. longer term, a lot of people will start in the Bay area. Um, but they very, they'll move to like LA or New York afterwards. So like the Bay area has kind of always been like a launching pad, hmm. um, from like a comedy perspective mm-hmm. versus like, Oh, this is somewhere like I settle down. Um, and I think like the people who do settle down, they've rarely settled down like in the city. Like they'll usually go out to like East Bay or mm-hmm. South Bay, um, like Oakland, San Jose, like those types of areas uh, where yeah. it's a little bit cheaper. So in terms of the comedy scene, are you do, how many clubs are there? Um, there in the city itself, there are two major clubs. Okay. Um, so that's actually something really interesting about like the difference, um, between comedy in San Francisco and Dallas too. Like, I feel like Dallas is like very like club heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, and San Francisco, it's almost all independent shows. That's and what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. And there's like two major clubs. Um, and those are like, you know, like big clubs like touring like headliners and Mm -hmm. stuff go there so so are those clubs very obtainable like here we have a lot of you know um open mics through the clubs Mm -hmm. that are run by comics that work at those clubs Mm -hmm. so there's a pathway into those clubs it may be harder are those clubs that way in your scene or i don't think they're as accessible in terms of like you know there's an open mic and then you can like you know very quickly like get on like a showcase or something like that um in san francisco uh the punchline is like one of the big clubs and Mm -hmm. there is a path to basically like get past which means you can like work the club right but it's like this whole process where basically like every sunday they have a showcase and as a comic you basically just show up and hope to get picked Mm -hmm. and the way you get is it like a raffle No. So the way you get picked is based off of your attendance. So you basically have to go every Sunday for like six months and then they put you up. And then if you do well, then you can go up in another three months Mm -hmm. and you just keep doing that for like the average, I think is maybe like four to five years. Mm -hmm. And then you can like get past at the club and then you can work like the two big clubs. Interesting. So they really want you to put a lot of time in. Yeah. 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 It's definitely like they want to see that you're like dedicated. Yeah. I get mixed feelings about that. Right. Because it's it's so hard to be able to dedicate that kind of time when you're not seeing progress. Yeah. But it definitely weeds people out. Yeah, definitely. And I, I struggle with that, too, just from the perspective of like, like, I know I need to like put in my dues and just like spend time there versus like. If that same night I have, like, the opportunity to do a show somewhere else Mm -hmm. that's not a club, I'm like, do I take the show where I can, like, continue to, like, get better? Yeah. Or do I just, like, go and kind of, like, you know, kind of invest my time in that? What do you like doing better? Do you like doing the Um, more of the indie, indie shows? I do like the indie shows a lot, um, mostly because I think, like, the types of audiences you get are, like, more diverse. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like people who, like, go to a comedy club have, like, certain expectations. And I love just, like, meeting people, like, at shows who have just, like, never gone to a comedy show before. Or Mm -hmm. sometimes it's, like, the show's at, like, a restaurant and some unsuspecting victim (laughs) shows up. But then they enjoy it. I just came here for a nice dinner. Yeah. I I was going to have to listen to this. Right. And then it's, like, oh, they found comedy and that's super cool. Um, But I kind of get it. And I think think it's, I think it's, like, kind of brutal. But I, I... do see like like every single comedian who's mm-hmm. kind of like risen out of the Bay Area has gone through that process. So I respect it. Yeah. I uh one of the things I want to do is to kind of understand these different scenes better. I would yeah. love to I don't I'm not able to right now, but I would love to take, you know, a good road trip where you spend like a week mm-hmm. or two in each scene and just watch oh, yeah. multiple nights at different clubs and just kind of see how stuff functions because they're all so different. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I want to see the clubs. 
The clubs yeah. are all so unique, you know. Oh yeah, even in San Francisco, like the two major clubs are like super different from mm-hmm. each other. Like the punchline is like very like small and like intimate. Mm-hmm. And Cobb's, which is the other big club, is like huge. It's like two levels, like mm-hmm. seats like a couple hundred people. Two levels though. Yeah, that's kind of cool that it's like a medium sized venue, but it's two levels. So it's like a mini theater. A little bit, a little bit, but it's still like tables, like you would yeah, see, yeah. like at like hyenas. But like when you're on example. the second level, are you like really close to the stage still? No, you're okay, kind you're... of like further back. Okay, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting. It's also interesting to see like the different like social dynamics as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I like love coming back to Dallas, just because I'm like, oh, it's like very, it's like honestly a little bit refreshing compared to like San Francisco, you know, just, Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if it's because like I'm visiting, but I'm like, I feel like people here are just like so friendly. (laughs) I hear that a lot. I mean, we, a lot of people are moving here now and I think we weird out a lot of people like how easily we say like, you know, uh, like if I just walking into the grocery store and I just catch a glance with someone, it's usually just like, Hey, how's it going? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you can tell who hasn't lived here for a while Mm -hmm. because they're a little weirded out. You know, (laughs) they're a little like, why are you talking to me? They're like, why are you hitting on me? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And you're just like, I'm just trying to be a decent human being. Oh my God. And especially me, like I enjoy podcasting and meeting people. So I can talk to almost anyone. Right. And, uh, it, yeah, I can tell it's a little, in their eyes, it's, like, more aggressive. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's like, I swear, like, I'm married, I'm not hitting on you. Yeah. It's like, That's what you would say if you were hitting on me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you're like, I'm genuinely interested in you as yeah, a human. Yeah, yeah. And they're just shocked. <laughs> yeah, Texas is weird because we are very, very friendly. Um but then it's like politically, we can be very, very not friendly, <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know? So it's very strange. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah. And it's so funny, too, because, yeah, it's San Francisco. People are like, oh, we're all so liberal. But sometimes they're like super mean, you know? My experience when I was young in San Francisco, I used to be in a punk rock band. Oh. And um, we were touring around playing music. And that's one of the reasons I was there. And, um, you know... Back uh, back then, I had even more of a Texas accent. I still have mm-hmm. one now, but you just don't ever hear it, right? Because right. you're always around Texans. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember when I was asking for stuff, people were being really like smart asses uh-huh. about my, like you know, like I was wanting to watch the uh, the famous trolley. Yeah. Right. And right. Uh, I walked up and I was like, "Hey, do you guys know if the trolley's fixing to come?" And they're like, fixing to come? And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah the trolley. I'd love to see it." And they're like, "No, no, we understood, but like it's not broken." And I was yeah. like. And I was like, oh, fixin'. Oh, yeah. You're was, like, there's no G. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, it's about to come. And yeah. I was like, cool, fuck you. Like, you yeah, know? you're like, th- yeah. It was stuff like that. Where, yeah. uh, and again, that wasn't everybody. But um, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's not, this is not Texas right now. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. But once I got past that, it felt like it was a very friendly city. You know, it yeah, was cool. Yeah, yeah. I feel like most cities, right, you have like the friendly people versus like the yeah. unfriendly people. You just got to kind of focus on Well, because like, even here in people. Dallas, we have all the pretentious assholes around Yeah, too. definitely. Like, Jesus. Yeah. yeah, you just got to focus your efforts on like the people who are good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite part about San Francisco? Oh, the hesitation. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I will say that I love uh, California. Like we went to Big Sur oh, and Big I feel Sur's like, gorgeous. and I know that's totally different than where you're at, Yeah, but I was like, Jesus, I could retire here. It's so beautiful. Oh, I was like, so I need beautiful. to find a work. I need to find something that I can do remotely yeah. and just live out here. And yeah. Like the... That's what California has is it's so scenic and beautiful in so many places. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like we drove – like because we flew into uh, San Francisco and then we drove south to Big Sur. And oh, then uh, that's amazing. what else is down over there? Monterey. S- Monterey, yeah. Santa Cruz. Yeah, you yeah. know, we just kind of did that little trip. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, it's all a little different and it's all fucking beautiful. Oh, my gosh. It's, beautiful. it's amazing. Yeah. You know, to know that we went from um, like those beautiful tall trees in right. San Francisco yeah. to like the uh, beautiful cliffs in mm-hmm. Big Sur and then we're down – Looking at whales and yeah. you know, sea lions and stuff. Oh, it's and gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And so it's like, God, I want to live there. And then um, I don't want to live there at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, it's amazing to visit. Yeah. Amazing to visit. Yeah. yeah. I think the nature is definitely like a big thing for me. Like even in the city, like all the parks and everything. Mm-hmm. Like I love just like taking walks through the park and just kind of like thinking and like, you know, mm-hmm. trying to like, you know get ideas for like writing and stuff and then yeah like Big Sur love Big Sur and then if you go east there's like Tahoe Mm -hmm. um, up north like Mendocino where you can go hiking Mm -hmm. Um, yeah it's all amazing I mean that's where it's at and I love the values that California has like when they when you on paper talk about how you just really want to help all these people and and it's just like I agree with all of that I just feel like it's all being implemented 
so poorly right. and I don't have any ideas of how to do it better. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's oh, like, 100%. I, it's like, man, you guys have this huge problem. You say you want to fix it, but it's getting worse. Yeah. And it's, but I don't know how to fix it either. Yeah. And, uh, and we're starting to feel some of those same effects here in Texas. Really? Yeah. We're just, we're going to be further behind. Yeah. But like, you know, here in Dallas, it's like our homeless population is rising. Really? I mean, it's going up and up and up. Same in Austin too, I've yeah. heard. Especially oh, with I like, would say Austin's ahead of us for sure. Yeah. Because we're starting to do more of the, um, what do they call it? It's like aggressive architecture. Where like under bridges, instead of just having the dirt that's normally in there, you oh. put like giant uncomfortable rocks so oh, people can't sleep. I see, I see. And like your bus stop benches are no longer a bench. It's got the rails uh, so yeah, that you can't yeah. lay on it. Mm-hmm. Those types of things. Yeah. And uh, and that's because, you know, it's it's just getting more. And it, what do you do, though? You can't just bust them away. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. They're people. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the, as a state, at least, maybe even as a country, it's like we're in this zone where... It's like, we don't want any of these people here, but yeah. we also don't want to invest in anything to change the situation. Right, exactly. So, yeah. I don't know. I think Texas is going to start feeling it over the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I think it's probably like across the nation, yeah. too, just as like, you know, the economy is kind of like yeah going downhill. I was like, I don't know a lot about it. I just know it's not good. Yeah. And I'm like, I know like everyone's like really feeling it. So if you're already kind of in like a vulnerable population. Yeah. Well, yeah. and just... I mean, when you start doing the math on most people's finances, you realize that you're a couple of either bad decisions or just bad luck. You're a couple of those away from being homeless. Yeah. You know, you're really like you don't have the big Mm -hmm. safety net that you think you have. Yeah. It's like if your job decides to shut down and you can't afford your mortgage. Right. That's it. Yeah. You know, how long can you survive? Yeah. Three, four months. Most people, maybe. Yeah. Like we're all functioning off of a lot of luck. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I do. I feel bad. It's like when you hear about L.A. and there's like. 70,000 homeless people. Yeah. It's like, how do you even begin to, you know, change that? Right. So I don't know. But I do love California. And I hate when people talk so much shit about it. Because yeah. it's like... Uh, you don't like California politics, but California is yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, it's okay. In California, people talk shit about Texas. Oh, I know. So yeah, I know. It's equal. <laughs> yeah, Texas is definitely like, if you tell anyone about Texas, mm-hmm. you know you're immediately going to get shit for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my one of the jokes I have in like my normal set involves yeah. like, I'm from a third world country called Texas, <laughs> and I cannot do that joke in oh, Texas. No. Oh, God, no. You should try. You should I, see if you could get it out there. I've tr- I did it once just like on accident yeah. at Plano House of Comedy. It was Okay, like, and that's definitely a more conservative crowd up there because yeah. it's further north and And yeah. it just like I was on autopilot that night <laughs> and it just came out and as soon as I said it like I think I looked as baffled as the audience and no I was laughs. like it was like nervous chuckles yeah. and I was like I feel that too. <laughs> I think there's a very likable quality about you, though, because you're you're not threatening at all. You seem very friendly and approachable, yeah. even like even when you're on stage. Oh, good. I feel like you could get away with saying some crazy shit up there. Yeah, maybe I should try more. Yeah, I think you could, because I mean, even like one of your jokes where you're talking about um, paleo cocaine. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Just looking at you, I wouldn't think I was going to hear about paleo and keto cocaine. Yeah, right? yeah, mostly coke. Yeah, no one, no one suspects cocaine. But I out love of it. It's like that's what I want. That <laughs> left turn when I'm yeah, watching. Yeah. I really like that. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, oh man, I'm trying to think of your bits right now. But like anyway, Costco car. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorite ones. I right think now. you could lean heavy into that stuff. Yeah, because yeah, you yeah. have a very likable presence where people. Like, people would really hesitate. That's probably why you can walk, th- walk through the Tenderloin most often. Is people are just like, not her. She, yeah. seems, she seems nice. <laughs> we don't want to break her spirit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go for someone else who's already broken. Have you talked about, first of all, the elephant in the room about the bad driving and being Asian? Is that just... Um, have you talked about any of that on stage? Any of the driving stuff? Not... Not even from the Asian angle, but just yeah. any of the bad driving. Not really. Um, because the crowd will instantly get uncomfortable because in their mind, they're going to make that stereotype connection. Yeah, Without exactly, you ever saying anything. Exactly, exactly. And that's actually something that I've, so I haven't, and it's like something I struggle with um, a lot. Not like driving, jokes about driving in general, but mm-hmm. like thinking about like the type of comedy that I do mm-hmm. and what kind of audiences it appeals to. And so like, you know, I have a couple jokes about being Asian, but I try to like diversify a little bit. So like people don't see me and just think like, oh, 
oh, she's like an Asian, an Asian comic, and yeah. she's just going to talk about being Asian. Yeah. Um, so, so it's hard because like I think like those jokes like come to me more naturally too. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so I see, and I'm not a comic. I don't perform. I just enjoy comedy, which I think is like and, beautiful. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. But uh, no, I just and I get fascinated with that because I love going to open mics here. And then, that is insane. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's sometimes it's brutal. Yeah. Um, but I do like it because eventually you start seeing some people progress. That is beautiful. And it's so awesome it's to go like, to oh, see. that shit show they were working on three months ago. Mm-hmm. They changed some stuff around yeah. and it's pretty funny now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even at those open mics, as bad as they can get, it's like you can see the premise that someone's trying to run with. Yeah. And you get kind of excited. You're like, oh, I see what they're trying to do. It's yeah. just not there. And uh, what, what were we talking about? The not trying to be an Asian comic. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it, and that seems to be the craziest thing is watching someone try to find their voice. Yes. You know, and, and it's like I've, I've thought about it multiple times. It's like I don't even know what my voice would be on stage. I can't imagine going, who am I going to be? And it's like, well, right. you need to be yourself. But what is yourself? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think about that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm like, this should be so easy because it's me. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like. I know who I am off stage, but I can't like condense that into someone on stage, if that makes sense. Mm. Do yeah. you think that's because you're doing shorter sets right now? I don't know. I think it's because I just sometimes I feel like I function off of extremes. Like, for example, like I feel like depending on who you talk to and depending on like my mood, like people on any given day will be like, oh, Denise, she's like a super like silly person. And mm. then you ask someone else and they're like, oh, Denise, she's like depressed (laughs) (laughs) and i'm like oh those are two big different things but i'm like i feel those like very intensely so i'm like ah what does that look Mm. like on stage and honestly that's difficult too because it means which version of you is going to show up to the show that night right exactly which i think like being able to understand like what like persona i guess i'm trying to convey Mm -hmm. um is more helpful um, so like my mood that night doesn't really matter. Um, I'm really, I'm realizing I sound bipolar right now and I'm like, no, no. it's totally human to have. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, it, it's totally, um, unnatural to go up on stage in front of a bunch of people all the time. Right. So the average person isn't going to think about it the way you do because they're never doing that. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and people are like, well, I'll just be myself. And it's yeah. like, well, it's easy to be yourself around your friends, your coworkers and your families. Right. Now go be yourself around strangers. Yeah. And you don't know anything about the strangers. Yeah, exactly. You know? And it's like, I think the hard thing and the fascinating thing about stand up is that like, you need to like, you have a very limited amount of time to like paint a picture of who you are. Mm-hmm. And make that funny. Um, And so it's like I could paint a picture of myself, but a full picture of myself, but that would take a while, you know? That's probably the hard part for you right Mm -hmm. now is that how do you put down some background, connect, and then get to your jokes in seven minutes? Right. Exactly. Without without it just seeming like you're just flying through stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's difficult. It's it's difficult. And I think like, um, you know, I'm coming up on two years now. I feel like this past year, like I've really tried to like explore more about like different angles of, you know, how I want to present myself. So like I had a phase like last last fall where I was like trying like a lot of jokes about around like being anxious or like having Mm. like experienced depression in the past. And I was like, I don't really like this just in terms (laughs) of like I was like it's not fun for me to talk about. So like right now I'm kind of in like, let me like talk about things that are just like more fun to me and like more like whimsical and silly. You know, that seems like a great way to go. Yeah. Because, because of the the time constraint you have. Yeah. Right. I I think about, uh, you know, my background's in music and I think about that as the same way I think about like albums. Mm -hmm. It's like most artists, when they put out their first album, you can't get into like deep music yet. It's too heavy for people. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have to have these kind of easier, more digestible hits 100%. That are just fun and silly. And then like your second or third album, that's when you can, like people know you. Yeah. It's almost like a first date. Like mm-hmm. you would never be on your first date and be like, well, I have a lot of depression, but yeah. sometimes I'm silly. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of baggage. <laughs> yeah. Even though the average person has all that same shit. Right. right? Exactly. So it, it's extremely relatable, but it's mm-hmm. like, how do you get it out there without just coming on stage and just be like, so 
Sometimes I'm crazy and sometimes yeah. I'm depressed. Yeah. We don't know who we have tonight. Oh, who do we have? I don't know. And yeah. then I think and then I think the second challenge too is like how do you make like these heavy topics like funny? Um and that's what yeah. I admire about like some comics like like Louis C.K. for mm-hmm. example. He does a great job with like heavy topics. I get so hesitant talking to women about how much I think Louis C.K. is great because of his obvious you know, background and controversy, yeah. but he is incredible at that. Yeah, yeah. He you're so uncomfortable. But you don't look away. You're so engaged. Yeah. And it's like he just like is able to like make it like just he just finds the funny in something that is like so unfunny. Did you ever watch his SNL bit? I was just about to bring that up. The child. Mo- yes. Yeah. That is one of my all time go to. Oh, my gosh. Of like comedic genius. Yeah. And you can tell like the audience is trying not to be on board with it. They are so uncomfortable. Yeah. But it's like if you really just think about that premise, it's incredible. And for people who don't know, he had a great premise about how. Uh, it's even hard to say it on this. Like, yeah. But basically he was trying to say, like, he's not defending child molest- uh, child molesters, but he's saying it's got to be so incredible for them to know they're risking everything yeah. and they're still going to do it. Right. And if you go watch the full bit, like, clearly I just said something that sounds absolutely horrible. Yeah. But uh, go watch the bit and it's... It works. But it's incredible. And you're yeah. like, oh my God, I never, ever thought about it that way. The only bit I've yeah. heard get close to that was Mark Norman was talking about a similar thing about like, uh, you know, this is obviously like an abridged version, but um, he was just talking about how lucky he is that he's not into little kids as a grown man. Oh, I don't think I've heard that one. Yeah, because he he said something along the lines of like, you know, when I was little, Uh I liked little girls because they were my age. Uh And he's like, I also liked grape juice when I was little. Yeah, He's like, I still like grape juice now. He's like, what if I still just liked little kids? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. And he had like a weird premise like that. And you're yeah. like, ooh, that's so dicey to yeah. leave that. But it's so funny when you do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, imagine how many rooms he almost, like, Louie almost got kicked out of working on that bit. Right. Where yeah. they're like, you fucking defending child molesters? Like, right. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's, I'm just like, wow. Like, to be able to, like, take yeah. that, I think that's, like, what makes someone, like, great. I'm yeah. glad to see he's coming back because I think he is one of the greatest. Of all time. A hundred percent. Did you watch his new special? Um, I watched, the last thing I watched was, he didn't call it a special, he called it like a live stream the from Madison, Madison Square, Square Garden. Garden. So good. That was incredible. That was incredible. And, um, oh God, I forgot her name, but the female opener for him. Oh my gosh, she was amazing. The one who was talking about how um, black people, or serial killers have done more for black people than Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, that bit. yeah, yeah. So good. She was amazing. I can't remember her name. But, I can't either. Oh, I'll have to um, find it later, but, uh, yeah, it's like yeah. She to me embodied that kind of like New York style of comedy mm-hmm. where you just fucking go for it. And yeah, you don't care. Like she had that attitude of like I don't give a shit what you think about right. what I'm about to say. Um, it was incredible. Yeah yeah, 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 it's amazing. You should watch his new special. I need um, to. Yeah. Well, he does everything on his website now. Yeah. So I forget to go like. Right. I, I don't mind giving him money for it. I just forget yeah. to do it. Yeah. 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 You should definitely do it. Um, it's really cool because it's like um, there's the Madison Square Garden thing mm-hmm. that you watch live. Um, and then his special. A lot of it is from that set, but okay. you can see the evolution of yeah. even some of the jokes. And I'm like, dang. So this would have been after Madison Square Garden? Yes. Like he was working on it there a little bit too? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Exactly. And he has like a new closer and like mm. some bits that he had. He just like, I thought they were already great, but he just like elevated them even more. And it's just like little things in terms of like how he phrases things mm. or the order that he says things. And I was like, that was fantastic. When he first started kind of sneaking back into culture Mm -hmm. right because it was rough for him um it's like just from doing this show you know i get to know some of the local comics and one Mm -hmm. of them texted me and was like um louis ck is going to beat the addison improv he's like he's like they're not ad really advertising it they're like but if you go on their website you can get tickets right now so we went on and i asked my wife i was like are you cool with this you know i didn't i really didn't know how she felt about the whole thing she's like oh fuck yeah yeah i'm cool okay i love you uh yeah (laughs) and so we got tickets and that is probably going to be the most incredible comedy show that i've seen to see someone of that caliber Uh in a room that only holds a couple hundred people right i'll never see that again yeah and was he just like working on like brand new stuff do you remember the set that someone kind of leaked and he got in a bunch of trouble because mm-hmm. I can't remember what he was making fun of. Um, you know, he was working on a set somewhere like maybe like the Comedy Cellar or something mm-hmm. like a smaller club like that. And somebody filmed him and released it and everybody mm-hmm. dogpiled on him mm-hmm. and tried to recancel him, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. And um, it was a lot of that material. And he was addressing a lot of the 
stuff that he went through. Like, I think one of his opening jokes was like, uh, he's like, you know, he just straight up addressed it. He's like, look, if you ever, you know, uh, want to masturbate in front of somebody, he's like, you need to ask permission first. <laughs> and he's like, and then if they say yes, he's like, ask permission again. <laughs> and he's like, and if they still say yes, he's like, just don't fucking do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, That's, and he's going on. And then he yeah. goes into like material about how like it was wrong and all this, yeah. but he was making it so funny. Yeah. And people were not happy about that. At Addison Improv, we all loved it. Yeah. everybody. But you know, when he's working on it yeah. and somebody just releases a clip online, everyone online who's not in the club and you yeah. only see 20 seconds, mm-hmm. they're losing their mind over it. Right. But right. I mean, it was incredible. It's like, yeah. I'll never... I think my f- personal favorite comic is Bill Burr. Okay, okay. Um, I just relate to him. Like, yeah. I'm not saying he's the best to ever do it, but I, I just connect with his humor right. so well. And I'll never see him at a club like that. Yeah. You know, I'll never get to experience that. Yeah. He's too big for it now. Yeah, he might drop in. You never know. I One of the things I hope, like, if I do anything with this little podcast, yeah. it's that I have a little part in making our scene the type of scene where people of that caliber will drop in at, like, a backdoor comedy club yeah. just because it's fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no money. It's just like, I heard this, I was doing the Verizon theater or whatever. Uh I heard the spot was cool. Let me do 10 minutes before I go do my set. That's amazing. That'd be incredible, you know? And I mean, at your show last night, we had a little bit of that with Ralph Barbosa. Oh, yeah. You know, that was not on the ticket. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I were in the corner when they said his name. I was like, no way. Yeah. We get a little Ralph Barbosa drop in. I was like, yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Was everyone around you like freaking out? I think locally, he's still at that stage where if you're into comedy, we all know. Know. Yeah. But if if you're like, did your sister know who he was? Oh, no, absolutely yeah. not. So if you're not mm-hmm. kind of a comedy nerd, yeah. I think he still flies under your radar. Yeah. But it's interesting, like how the Internet contributes to that now, mm-hmm. because like there was an audience member who came up and talked to me afterwards. And he was like, oh, my gosh, like I saw that Ralph guy on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> and he was on stage. And I was like, yeah. Wow, the internet's crazy. Right. Whoa, yeah. He's real. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 That is interesting. And. Yeah, it's interesting how you can really connect with somebody on fucking TikTok, which you shouldn't be able right. to. And I always go back and forth with the social media stuff because yeah. depending on the day, I really hate it. Or I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. Look, yeah. we connected with all these people and, right. you know, it's amazing. Yeah. And then someone in the comments is like, you fucking suck. And you're like, yeah, internet sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, I am humbled. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, But I mean, to me, that's one of the steps in this scene to getting there is people like that kind of ascending and but yeah still staying with their roots around here right um so i was so excited to see that he's popping in at like hyenas i think he did something at addison yeah like right before yeah, yeah, yeah and it's yeah, like yeah. that that stuff along with hopefully what other locals do around here yeah if bill burr ever just dropped in on any of our clubs yeah i could die happy yeah i feel like all the comics like in the dallas scene who are like you know either like not really in Dallas anymore, but started in Dallas. Like, I feel like they always kind of like come back and like help their people, which I yeah. think is really awesome. Like, like, um, like Pung, I yeah, think, Pung. always is mm-hmm. always coming back, like, Pung's doing great. shows here. Well, and we even have some guys who were bigger earlier that still, like, uh, Paul Varghese was oh, a big yeah. name. He was working with like Russell Peters, yeah. and these huge names. Uh huh. And I had, I got to talk to him about it, and he, uh, you know, it's like he had the opportunity of like L.A. or New York, and he's like, I want to put roots here, you know, in yeah, this Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, it's, you know, he's been doing it for so long. I think people forget that he made a decision like that. Right. And it's like, man, you have to respect people who, you know, love their scene that much mm-hmm. to, to like stay here with it. Yeah. But uh, how how is it for you knowing you're from here, but you started comedy in San Francisco? Do they, like by the locals, are you treated as a out-of-town San Francisco comic? I am, yeah, okay. yeah. Which I honestly think like, works in my favor okay. because I feel like people are like, oh, she's only here for like a week. We'll be extra nice to her, you know? <laughs> Versus it's like, if I lived here, they'd be like, do we actually like her? We don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. But um, but in general, yeah, I think people are like super welcoming out here. So while you're um, here, are you trying to drop in like on as much stuff as you can? Or how do you like to um, plan it? Usually, so I usually come home over the holidays um, and I'll usually like try and do like as many mics and shows as I can. I'm in town right now for a friend's wedding. Okay. Yeah, so like the wedding stuff starts tomorrow so I'm like, dang, like won't be able to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so like Sammy just happened to be headlining that night and I've worked with him before. That's um, awesome. So it just worked out super well, but I was like, alright, I'll get one 
on set in. Yeah. Um, so is that the only one you get to do while you're in town? I think so. I think so. Um, there is a show at Dallas Comedy Club tomorrow mm-hmm. um, that Emily runs, uh, and she was like, "Oh, you can is like this come the uh, Who to See at DCC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that show. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, is that ten thirty? Maybe I can like go after you the can wedding that reception." Out. But I'm like. Ooh. You can figure that out. Yeah. I'm like, you I need to do that. that. Yeah. Have you got yeah. to perform it at DCC yet? Yeah. It's yeah, a good yeah. club. It's a good club. And um, the comics that run through that club, it's almost annoying how positive and helpful they are sometimes. <laughs> they're, it's such a. It's, but they're very nice. They're very, very nice. Cool. And they're like fairly. The club itself is fairly new, it sounds. So what happened is there used to be a place called Dallas Comedy House. Mm-hmm. And it was here for a long time. Yeah. So it had like three different locations in Deep Elm. It kept moving. And then the last time it moved, it moved from Main Street to Elm Street, where Dallas Comedy Club is now. Mm. Same exact building. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, it went under. And they just couldn't stay afloat. And so Dallas Comedy Club was able to purchase that. Mm. And so that it went from Dallas Comedy House to Dallas Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. The rooms and everything, the layout, it's all the exact same. And Mm -hmm. then they just kind of did a little touch-ups here and there. But the same stages. And they were able to keep it alive as a mix of stand-up and improv. Yeah. So Dallas Comedy Club is fairly new, but they're kind of living on the past of Dallas Comedy House. Right. So it's weird. It's a new old venue. Yeah. 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 I really like it. Um, I went by the open mic yesterday before Hyenas to try and see if I could get a spot on the mic. I couldn't, which Uh, is fine. It's Um, one of the better open mics, though. When When you come back... Yeah. When you come back, message me, and I'll, I'll try to message some people yeah, and see, yeah. see if I hold any clout. I don't know if I do. They might just be like, stick to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool because I was like seeing like audience people go away, yeah. and I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is wild. I'm like, that's so cool that you could actually yeah. like work on your material. <laughs> if Dallas Comedy Club could get a parking lot of some kind, yeah, I think it would be the biggest club in Dallas. Oh. I think that's the only thing they struggle with down there is – um. Deep, you know, Deep Ellum. I don't know what it, I can't remember what it was like when you were here in Richardson. Did you ever come down to Deep Ellum? No, never. Okay. <laughs> Deep Ellum has always been in these waves of like fun and cool and like really sketchy. You might get uh-huh. shot, might get stabbed. Yeah. And, it just, and right now we're on this huge upswing. But Deep Ellum still always has that stigma of like, oh, I don't want to go down there. It's a pain in the ass. You're going to have to pay oh. for parking. Even if you can find a parking spot, you're going to get harassed by homeless people. There might be a fight breakout. Somebody mm. might get shot. And it's just not that bad currently. Yeah. It's it's pretty nice. Yeah. So I think that's the only thing that keeps a lot of outsiders, people outside of like Dallas proper from going to Dallas Comedy Club mm-hmm. is they don't realize like just park on a meter or park in a lot and you're good to go. Yeah. And it's so far to the end of Deep Elm that I usually find free parking and just like walk two blocks down. Yeah. I feel like there's like park like park parking like near the office buildings and yeah, stuff. But if yeah. you don't go down there all the time, you don't know that. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's the only thing that hurts them because they yeah. have that incredible patio. Yeah. They've got that nice bar area. Yeah. And their open mics always have people in it. It's awesome. And it's not it's not like regulars. Like you mm-hmm. see a cool group of people kind of going in and out of there. Yeah. I so love it. It's fun. It's one of my favorite spots to watch shows, but yeah. it's also like I hate driving down there sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but I always still go. I would go to Emily's show tomorrow though for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. a good show. Um, she's one of my favorites. Oh, she's great. She's mm-hmm. great. She was um I remember uh the first time I did comedy in or no, the second time I did comedy in Dallas um, was uh, winter of 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I was like really going to like every single mic possible to just try and like meet people. And yeah, like Emily was like one of like the nicest people to me. Um, she like introduced me to like everyone mm-hmm. else who had kind of like, you know, been around in the scene for a while. And it was just like very kind and very, very welcoming. How did you approach coming here to do comedy? Did you just reach out to anybody or did you just show up at Mike's? How did you yeah, do that? Yeah, I reached out to a couple people. So I don't know. I feel like I've been very, I've been very lucky in terms of like people just like being really nice mm-hmm. and helping me. So like the first open mic I ever did in Dallas was in June of 2021. Um, and I, it was at Backdoor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I met a guy um, who was like, oh my gosh, like you're Asian. And he was Asian. And he <laughs> okay. was like, he was like, let me introduce you to Pong. Okay. Um, and he was like, he's, you know, like very established in the scene. Like maybe he can help you out. And then Pong helped me out um, and like talked to me about like the different mics that were good to go to help me connect me with different people. Mm-hmm. And so it just kind of went from there. Um, so, yeah, I honestly, I'm like, I think I've just gotten very, very um, lucky in terms of like how kind people have been. I mean, 
maybe, but also it seems like you're somewhat assertive, like you will go and do something and you'll go and look for it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that is what holds a lot of people back is they get too nervous to even just go and just yeah. see what it's like. Yeah, I think that's the other fun thing about Dallas um, is like, you know, you go and I'm like, if I do horrible I'll never come back. <laughs> They're like, who was Denise Lee? I don't know. Well, okay. That being said, then how did you approach starting comedy in San Francisco? It was honestly the same way where really? I was like, it was like an adventure for me where I was like, let me just like try this thing mm-hmm. and I'm going to do it. And then if I don't like it, I will disappear back into the ether and no one will ever know. What What was the moment where you decided, I think I want to do a stand up set? Um, were you just super into comedy and thought it'd be fun? or yeah. what you know so so it's interesting because i've never been one of those people who was like super into comedy like the first comedy like full special i ever watched was ali wong mm-hmm. and even after i watched her special i was like i can't do what she does i mm-hmm. can't talk about the things she does because i didn't know there were like different types of comedy was this the one there. where she was like pregnant in the leopard dress yeah. yeah yeah okay um so so yeah um but it's kind of crazy how it all went down. So like I, I work I work in tech and mm-hmm. I have like a lot of like Zoom meetings and stuff. And I remember like there was one meeting where like one of my coworkers was like, oh, my gosh, Denise, like you're so funny. You should try <laughs> stand up. And in retrospect, I think she said that because she wanted me to like <laughs> stop making like, jokes. Could you quit with your little uh, yeah, with, please? with your little quips? We're trying yeah. to have a meeting. <laughs> yeah, I think she wanted to talk about work, and but for some reason, <laughs> you're, you're just like, wow. I was like, she, she so has funny. a point. I was like, I am hilarious, and it just like it truly just like stuck with me, and yeah. I kind of made it a goal in 2021 to like try an open mic just once and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was kind of like still kind of during like the pandemic. I was going to say, wasn't everything shut down for y'all? Because y'all were far more more strict than yeah, we were Yeah, yeah. So we were super shut down. And so I was like, all right, like I decided in January, I was like, in, this year I'm going to do one open mic. And so I was like. But, okay. what, but what made you say, I got to do this? So I said that. Um, I, it surely wasn't just Carol on the Zoom meeting, right? Um, Janice. Uh, <laughs> Janice? <laughs> That's a better name. <laughs> Janice. Janice. Shout out to her. Um, I think there was another part of me, too, where, like, I think, like, I have a very, like, obsessive personality. Mm. And honestly, like, at the time, I was very, like, obsessed with work. And my entire identity was tied to that. And so, like, it was a combination of, like, her kind of saying that, me, like, kind of knowing that, like, you know, it's been easy for me to make people laugh usually. Mm. Um, and then also I was like, I want to tie my en- identities to something else that's not work, that nobody that nobody can like, nobody at work can like judge my value off of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, all right, like stand up is like a good way to do that. So it's kind of like your, your version of like Fight Club. It was like the secret little thing you're going to try out. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And honestly, I was also like, oh, if I try, if I do stand up and I tell people at work I'm doing it, like maybe they'll be afraid of me. <laughs> I was like, maybe. Afraid of you. Like, like oh, she's going to talk about me on stage or something. Oh, interesting. And I was like, oh, no one cares. No one cares yeah. about my work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're safe from that. But it was like, it was kind of like all of those things coming together. Um, and yeah, my, my first open mic was actually in the Tenderloin on a sidewalk because um, it was still the pandemic. So. On a sidewalk. On a sidewalk in the Tenderloin next so to a bus stop. Where are people standing when they're watching you on a sidewalk? Are they also on the sidewalk? Um, yeah. So they have like these little like, uh, what are they called? Parklets. Okay. Um, so they have like little covered areas with like chairs and stuff. That's how people usually do like outdoor like dining and stuff. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, they just so like. So it's like just kind of in between sidewalks and buildings and you can sit down. Oh, yeah. It okay. was like in front of a it was at a bar but like in their parklet so it was mm. on the sidewalk in the tenderloin so like occasionally like in the middle of your set like someone just kind of crazy would just kind of barrel <laughs> through and it was great practice for hecklers you know well, i was gonna say what a great way to get used to the craziness of a stage exactly i was yeah. like this was rock bottom and now <laughs> now it's just upwards and then my second open mic was back door which was extremely different right and i was like wow. oh this is amazing yeah. And then I kind of settled somewhere in the middle with like other open mics where I was like, all right, it's not like the worst, but it's not like, you know. How did you feel after that first one, though? Um, I felt really good Um, just in the sense that I was like, okay, like 
I didn't get that many laughs, but I was like, I really loved like the writing process. And I feel Mm. like even now, like it's like the writing of the jokes that like really appeals to me. Um, And I was like, oh, like I want to keep writing that. And I think like my obsessive personality kind of started obsessing over comedy Mm -hmm. where I was like, okay, like I'm not the best that I could be. But I think, like, I can get there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to, like, obsess over it until, like, I get better. Yeah. Um, So it's probably still unhealthy. But, you know, now it's diversified. But but you have to be that way. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if you're not that way and you try to do anything, you know, artistic like this, Mm -hmm. you're just not ever going to be very good. Yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. You can be okay. Like, there's a lot of people in every comedy scene where it's like, you're pretty good, yeah, and that's fine, right? But you're not great, yeah. I'm like, how, yeah. So mediocrity, and, and I think, that's scary. yeah, and that that's because I think people do lack that obsessiveness. Yeah, I feel like such a a dick. Like, I don't perform, uh-huh. so I feel like a jerk scrutinizing that. No, nah, but I love comedy. That's a great observation. I love comedy, and it's like, yeah. look, you guys who've been doing the same material for five years. You know, it's, it's like, I, I understand why mm-hmm. you're there. It's mm-hmm. comfortable. It's difficult to write. Yeah. I'm not pretending that it's easy. Yeah. But it's like, man, you've got to do it. You've got to try. You know, you've got yeah. to try to get something new and be comfortable landing on your face again. Right. Yeah. And, and you see that fear in so many of these comics that are, they're good. There's uh-huh. nothing wrong with them. But it's right. like, I'm looking at you. It's like, I know you could be so much better. Right. But you're not doing it. Exactly. And I, I think that's what it is. I think they're not obsessed with getting better yeah 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 exactly i think like you really gotta like it's gotta be borderline unhealthy right oh a hundred percent like i feel like 99 percent of my day is like spent thinking about Mm -hmm. like comedy like even if i'm like at work like it's in the back of my mind where i'm like all right like that one bit like how do Mm -hmm. i like make that a little bit better um and yeah i think I definitely feel you on like, you know, seeing like the same jokes like through the years. And I get really like insecure about that, too. Um, And I feel like for me, like really like my my philosophy right now is like. I don't have to like have a brand new set every Mm -hmm. couple months, but how can I like make every joke better than it was the last set? I think you're in a zone where you're just trying to figure out how do you even get a solid 15 minutes, right? Exactly. And then from 15, how do you get 20 and 25 and 30? Yeah. But then once you know how to make a good 30 minute set, yeah. that's when you should be going like, all right, how do I constantly exactly. change? I think at the point you're at at two years, you're still focusing on like you, the stuff you were talking about earlier. Finding my Who voice. Who am I? What do I want to yeah. talk about? How do mm-hmm. I, you know, the more, most important thing would probably be how do I like to do comedy? Right. Because at the end of the day, it's like if you do it. And you don't get any laughs, but yeah. you really loved it yeah. and you liked what you were trying to get out there. So you'll keep doing it. Yeah. And that's far better than, you know, what do they want? Exactly. Yeah. That's such a great point. And I think that's something I'm only now recently realizing. And because I think like when I first started comedy, like I said, I hadn't really watched any comedy before. That's so fascinating. I was really just like writing what was funny to me. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Most of the time it didn't. But I was having <laughs> fun with it. Yeah. And then kind of like this last year. I kind of became too obsessed with it to the point where it was like I was watching so much comedy, but like mm. analyzing every single joke yeah. to the point where like it was not fun for me at all. And I was like, how come like my style isn't like their style? Like, how do mm. I write a joke the way like, you know, conventionally people write a joke? Um, and so I think, yeah, like I'm trying to like figure out like what's fun for me again. Cause I feel yeah. like sometimes like on my worst days, I'm like, I feel like people can tell that I'm like not having fun mm. because I'm like, wow, this sucks. <laughs> well, last night when I got to watch you, yeah. did you feel like you were having fun up there? Um, how did that feel for you? It felt pretty good. I honestly feel like I was like more n- I was definitely like more nervous than usual, which was like, well, not, it's a big sold out room, right? It was, it was mostly having my family there that oh, I was like, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sold out, sold out room of strangers. I'm like, great. Because again, if I bomb, you'll never see me again. Yeah. <laughs> um, last night. Yeah. Last night, I think I was, I was having, I was having fun, but I was also kind of like scared I guess Mm. just because like I was on a lineup of such heavy hitters (laughs) and I was just like Oh, wow. Like, well, because you were sandwiched between Ralph and Sammy, right? I was sandwiched between Ralph and um, 
what was the name? What was the host? Devin. Devin, Devin who's also, also incredibly funny. Yeah, super, super funny. Um, and I think part of me too is like, oh wow, like I'm the only woman on the lineup. Mm, so I okay. have to be extra funny. You feel that pressure, female comic? I used to I used to not, and then someone pointed it out once and yeah. they're like, Do you feel pressure that you're the only female and that you represent all the women if you're not funny? And I'm like, Oh crap. Now I <laughs> <laughs> It's it's interesting. I yeah. um I like Eliza Schlesinger a lot. A lot of people, I like her. A lot of people don't like her. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm learning that a lot of comics do not think she's funny, but... Is uh, it just because like, she's like very like... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But literally, like last week, I was hanging out with some comics after a show, and they were just like... They, somehow she came up, and they did not like her at all. And I, yeah. it was to the point where I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to say how much I like her. But <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> but I think she's funny. Yeah, I listen yeah. to her podcast a lot, so oh, I'll just listen okay. to her talk. Yeah. And she talks a lot about that, about how... Um, you know, if you're strong and opinionated, you're a bitch, mm, right? Mm-hmm. If you're like an alpha woman, you're yeah. like a bitch, right? And yeah. you're not. It's per, whereas if you're like a strong, opinionated guy, you're confident and right. you've got something to say. Yeah, kind of those differences. And so she's kind of opened my eye up, my eyes up a lot to just how much I may not even realize that I'm looking at a female comic differently. Yeah, you know, because yeah, I so I do I do think there's probably a lot of unconscious thought from an audience yeah definitely and i think it's just even just like the types of jokes you make right Mm -hmm. like um like if i were to make like a ton of like sex jokes like Mm -hmm. that would be interpreted very differently than if like a guy made a bunch of sex jokes yeah well in that even though in my experience with open mics it's like that's the go-to for male open micers it's like jerking off dick Mm -hmm. sex all this you know but when a woman does it they're just like jesus here she is talking about periods again yeah exactly which yeah i think kind of like same with the asian thing i'm like how do i Mm. make jokes like not about like being a woman or like you know yeah but there's a fine line though because the reason you would talk about being a woman is because you're a fucking woman yeah right and the reason you would talk about being asian is because you're asian yeah so there is a line of if you're trying to do comedy about yourself this is who you are have to be Yeah, so, I mean, you shouldn't, you know, not talk about it. Right, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. I think it's like, how do I kind of, like, make it accessible or, like, Mm -hmm. fun? show everyone what's funny about it? Have you tried yet to just not even give a shit about that and just talk about it and see what happens? Um, Because at the end of the day, if it's funny, like, if you're not leaning on it, right, if Uh it's just what you talk about because it's you and it's funny, then no one's really going to think about it that much. Like, a good example for me... Uh Uh-huh. Uh, would be, I noticed that I think Asian comics are going through what Indian comics just went through. <laughs> okay? Uh-huh. Which is, I think there are so many Indian comics who are finally realizing, like, you don't have to do the I'm a brown guy bomb 9-11 material, uh-huh. right? Yeah. They're finally moving away from that. Right. And it's like, that's not your identity. Yeah. But it gets such a good laugh from... Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of how to say it, but I just want to say, like, I guess the masses, dumb, uneducated crowds. Yeah. It's easy. It's it, a common denominator. It's easy if you're at a Texas club mm-hmm. with predominantly conservative people yeah. to be like, you know, bomb airport yeah. brown guy. And it's like, yeah. you know, they'll get a chuckle. And it's like, dude, you're funnier than that material. You right. don't have to do that. But now it's like guys like, have you met Arun Rama here locally? Love Arun. Okay. Arun is a good example of, you know, he's finding ways to talk about his Indian culture and mm-hmm. background and yeah. his experiences of being a true Indian American, someone who moved from India to America, mm-hmm. not just someone who's first generation here. Right. And there's mm-hmm. not a lot of, I don't know how many comics there are that are from his perspective where um, they're true Indians, Indian comics in America. Mm-hmm. And so he's finally found ways to start making great jokes about those cultural differences right. without it being like the weird. Um, the tropes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of Asian comics are going through right now because there's not a lot of big name Asian comics. They're just now like you're. Um, uh, oh, my God. Who'd you just say? Ali Wong. Ali Wong. Ronnie Chang. Yeah. Those guys, you know, those those people are still relatively new yeah. in the comedy world. And right. they're as famous as they are, they're not household names yet, right? Right. So I exactly. think I think a lot of unknown Asian comics are going through that same struggle yeah. of like, how can we talk about our culture without it seem like we're being real preachy and stereotypical and right. weird? Yeah, you know? yeah. And just, I think at the end of the day, it's like how, like, 
even if, if it's not about like being Asian mm-hmm. or anything, it's like, how can you have like a unique perspective on something True. at the end of the day? So yeah, I would love to see you just not even think about it and yeah. just go, fuck it. Like if it happens to be an Asian thing yeah. or a female thing, just put it in there anyway and just see yeah. how it goes. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. you could pull it off more than you think. I think, I think, I think you're right. I think like, I think like the Costco card joke is like the one. <laughs> I loved it. I, I love it too, but I feel so guilty making that joke Why? because I'm just like, oh man, it's about like being Asian. But honestly, I do love that joke so much. Well, right let me now. ask you this though. As an Asian woman, uh-huh. do you with other Asian women make the joke, make that joke? Like, would you would you ever joke about like, you know, the I don't want to step all over your bit because I want people to be able to hear. But basically, oh, it's OK. OK. But your joke is about how, like, you don't want to think that Asians all look alike, but you also want to share a Costco card yeah. with a bunch of people. right? Yeah. Yeah. Would you ever make that joke around like your sister or your mom? Oh, or yeah. Because it happened. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I think if you would actually make that joke yeah. with, within your culture, yeah. then that's what it's that's funny. A great barometer. Yeah. Right. Like if you would if you're willing to say it to your peers mm-hmm. in that culture. Right. Then it's fine. Right. Right. Because. Yeah. I mean, that's what everyone else is joking about, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. Yeah, I think it's a fine balance. Um, like if you said that to your sister and she's like, "That's fucked up." <laughs> it's like, she actually told me that was her favorite joke last night. Well, there you so, go. Yeah. yeah, I was like, "All right, we're gonna double down on." Because like, as a white guy, what we're gonna do yeah. if we're uncomfortable, the first thing we're gonna do is look around and see if there's an Asian laughing at it. And yeah. If they're laughing, he's like, "Okay, all right, <laughs> I think we're good here." <laughs> You're good. You got the green light. We'll do the quick double shoulder <laughs> check. I'm like, all right, I you think have we're- consent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would. I mean, as a as someone who just watches it, that's what I live for with comedy. Yeah, is it, it's my way to learn more socially about things I don't know about. Mm-hmm. So the more I, I think that's why I like Ronnie Chang a lot. Is oh my gosh, he goes for it. Yeah, you know? and Ali Wong does too. Yeah, but like Ronnie Chang had some great bit about. He's like, go ahead and fucking cancel me. He's like, you're going to send me back to Malaysia? He's like, I'd love to go yeah. back. <laughs> He's like, where I'm rich and famous and they have uh, socialized medicine. and like. <laughs> or another one, I think one of my very, very favorite bits that was just like so funny to me was where he was talking about like how Asians want their children to become doctors <laughs> and yet they are the most against modern medicine. <laughs> and I was like, that is so true. But that's great. And, and that's stuff that I wouldn't connect the dots on, right? As someone living in Dallas, Texas. So it's mm-hmm. like that, that is what's going to be really funny. Yeah. But it makes sense to you after well, you hear it. As soon as you hear it, you're like, that's right. right. Absol- oh my God. Yeah. How have I never thought of that? You yeah. know? And that, that's the really difficult comedy is the stuff that's right there in front of you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. did you get to watch um, Ralph's set at all? Oh, I watched the whole thing. Okay. It was beautiful. <laughs> when he was talking about, uh, I'm not going to get into his bit at all because I feel like he's working on it still. Yeah. But when he was talking about how babies should be more concerned about their first oh, impressions. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was hilarious. Fucking, and it's one of those, it's like, Jesus, that's right there. Yeah, I have never, yeah. ever connected those dots. Yeah. And that's really great comedy so i think if you leaned into the yeah. stuff you're afraid of you, uh-huh. would, you would find a lot of those little nuggets yeah definitely i shouldn't even say afraid of but you know what i mean yeah no i'm afraid of it for oh, okay. sure right. <laughs> yeah yeah um another comic i really love right now is shang wang have you is he the long-haired guy yes yes i know who you're talking about yeah. Yeah. i think he's got like a don't tell comedy or something he no no he's on netflix, netflix. Yeah, yeah yeah okay Sweet and juicy does he have glasses too mm. He yes. looks like an Asian hipster guy. Yes, right. he does. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. I haven't watched that. It's sitting in. I if you saw my Netflix yeah. m- list of like specials, I need to watch. Yeah, he's definitely in there, but I need to get to. That. Oh my gosh, he is probably like funny dude, huh? My favorite comedian right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's like he doesn't make his entire hour long special not a single joke about like being Asian. And then I um I met him last week actually in San Francisco and I was like talking to him about it and he was like, it's not that I like try to avoid it, but he was like, I just find like other things. Mm-hmm. He's he's just like, I just want to talk about other things right now. But just like the jokes he makes are just like such like everyday things that I'm like, wow, like I want to be able to do that. You know, like he has a joke yeah. about like the best part of going, the best part about any office job is the fact that you can print. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have heard that bit. Oh my God. It's that. beautiful. He's like, they just fucking let you print everything. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, I haven't printed anything at home <laughs> in years or something like yeah. that. Right? And yeah. And if you do, you print it on the lightest setting. Oh, I forgot that that was him. I must've just seen like a, you know, a reel or a TikTok yeah. or something. Oh my gosh. It's so funny. funny. Well, have you thought about, um, like what you would want to talk about that you've stayed away from. Um, like what would you want to talk about that you haven't turned into a bit yet? 
What are some what are some of the things that go around about? I really want to talk about snacks and going to the grocery store. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm very passionate about snacking. Okay. And I'm very passionate about like going to the grocery store to relax. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> just like wandering through to just like clear my head. I'm trying to figure out a way to make like either of those things funny. Mm. Um, but it's definitely like just like a world of like, man, I'm so passionate about so like this one thing. So then it's like the Costco free sample day or whatever. Is that like your your heaven or does it need to be your own snacks? Um, I think it has to be my own snacks, okay. you know? Um, and it's like I get excited like in San Francisco when I'm walking through different neighborhoods. Like sometimes I get kind of scared because I'm like, oh, this is like a sketchy part of town. But if I go in and I see like certain brands of snacks, I'm like, oh, this is this is nice. Like we're like, okay. What's the snack? Um, it's like Justin's peanut butter cups. Justin's peanut butter cups. <laughs> yeah. So you're just like scooping out peanut butter with a spoon or something? Or no, no, they're just like they're like Reese's, but like oh, fancy. Oh. And when I see those, I'm like, oh, this is a. Oh, so you got some bougie Reese's. I'm like, this is gentrified neighborhood. We're okay. <laughs> I'm like, we're safe. We're safe. <laughs> But if it's like you walk into a name, if you walk into a corner store and it's just like pickles in a bag, you're like, oh, I should mm. watch my back, you know. But have you ever had a pickle out of a bag? Because they're, they're really pretty good. solid. Right? They're so <laughs> good. They're so good. <laughs> okay, okay. What are some of the other snacks though that you love? Oh my gosh, I love I love popcorn. I love Boom Chicka Pop. That's mm. my favorite popcorn. Yeah. Um, I love like a medley of snacks so you get like I, I actually have a joke I'm working on right now where I'm talking about like I'm trying to like practice portion control because mm. like I eat like whole bags of like chips at once so yeah. I'm like I'll buy like multiple bags of chips yeah. and just eat like half of each bag you need to get on this material because I'm already on the journey with you <laughs> <laughs> because food addiction is one of my biggest vices. Oh I my eat gosh. so much trash food. Yes. And I can't stop. And it's like, you know, um, like when I was running marathons, I thought I would lose weight. Yeah. But it gave me an excuse to eat. I was like, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm burning calories. Oh, like yeah. Like I'm a runner, you know? Oh, yeah. When I first moved to San Francisco, actually, so I used to run. I used to be a runner. Yeah. Um, yeah I was also, I trained for, I didn't train for a marathon. I trained for a half marathon. Okay. And that was already too much for me. But I was gaining so much weight because I was like, I am voracious all the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're like, you know, you're checking your watch. You're like, I've, I've burned 1,500 calories. I can yeah. have a couple slices of pizza. My joints are telling me it's 1,500 <laughs> calories. Did you do the half? I did the half. Um, if I, you did, I'll tell you this. If you did the half, you uh, could do a marathon. That's false. You could do it. <laughs> I could do it, but I think I'd be unwell after. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, no, I actually used to be really involved in running. Like in San Francisco, I was like, um, or I, I guess I still am. I'm just not as active. Um, I was like part of this organization called Achilles. Okay. They actually have one out here in Dallas as well. But basically you like guide like um, people with like different physical disabilities in like mainstream races. So mm. like in San Francisco, it was usually like blind people. So you would like guide blind people like in marathons. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So and that so, was fun. Yeah. Wait, so you were doing – what type of event were you guiding someone in? Did you actually um, do it? Yeah, yeah. So um, so not for the year were that – Were you doing like 5Ks or something? The first half marathon I ever did, I did by myself. But after that, it was, yeah, like the San Francisco half, like Golden Gate, like 15K or whatever, mm. or Golden Gate half. Um, What's that yeah. like running – did you run with a blind person or who did you um, work with? I I've run with a couple blind people before. Once I ran with like um, a young boy who was from Denver uh, mm -hmm. and he was autistic. He was autistic. And so he needed help, like kind of like staying focused. So he could so, see. So what was your plan with the autistic person? And what was your plan with the blind person? With a blind person, like... I was just trying to keep up. If we're being honest, I was the weekly. <laughs> were you just shout? Were you just like left or like? What, did you, you know, have a so, rope or like? Um, what were you doing? So the person I was guiding wasn't like so severely like vision impaired that they needed like a rope. But some people will do ropes if they're like completely like oh, blind. A rope would terrify me if I'm the person guiding because it's yeah. like if I made you fall. Like because oh, of the rope or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, um, the person I was guiding, like he just like couldn't really see out of like one eye. So mm -hmm. I was kind of like on his left the whole time just to kind of like, you know, keep yeah. people around him, let him know if there's like something coming up. But um, were they happy at the end of all that? Were they glad you ran with them or were, yeah, they, yeah, they, were they like, I didn't really need this? Or? No, no, it was it was great. Um, yeah. And we would have like practice runs like every other week um, mm -hmm. where it like wasn't the actual race. So you got to know each other then. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And I did this more before the pandemic. After the pandemic, when we all got back to like running, and this is when I stopped because I was like, wait, I actually hate this, (laughs) was because like this guy, he had a treadmill in his basement during the pandemic and he just ran the treadmill every day and I did not do any of that. (laughs) And we tried to run together and I had to ask for breaks. <laughs> he was like, let's keep going. I was like, we need to. I was like, wow. I can't. <laughs> and what were you having to do with the autistic kid? Um, really just like keeping him on track because he would get like super distracted by like everything. He would want to stop. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't want to keep going. So it was like really like literally for 13 miles. Like I had like a list of things he liked to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I would well, just like talk about that. Kind of where was he out on the spectrum? Like was he... Like, how functioning was he? Um, like, how distracted, I guess, would he get in my... I, he clearly had to sign up for this and want to do it. Yeah, well, his mom helped him and okay. everything. Um, but he was, like... Uh, he definitely, like, needed... He definitely needed, like, someone there to, like, mm-hmm. kind of, like, guide him and, like, tell him, like, hey... So like, were you just, like, pulling going. on his shirt sleeve, like, over this way? Or, yeah, you know? yeah, or just, like, hey, like, let's, let's keep going until, like, over there, and then mm-hmm. we'll stop. Because, like, it'd be, like, you know... You see a dog and you're like, oh, a dog. Oh, or okay. or it's like around like mile ten or so. Um, he was getting really tired and he just wanted to like stop. Yeah. And I was like, Ben, like we gotta keep going because like they were like about. So the reason I was still able to do it was because he ran really slow mm, to the okay. point where it was like a fast walk for me. Yeah. Um, That's like my marathon pace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, all right, I can do this. I was like, I can walk for a long time. Um, yeah. But um, they were like almost cleaning up the route mm-hmm, after mm-hmm. us. I was like, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. I watched, I got obsessed with this kid. I say kid, he's probably like 20 or something, but he is the first um, person with Down syndrome to complete the Iron Man. Oh, that's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. And watching, they had a ton of footage of him, yeah. you know, and, and he had a person like that, a trainer who went with him through the entire uh, event yeah. to help keep him focused. Yeah. And it was really eye opening because you see him have the same break that mm-hmm. the average person has when mm-hmm. they get in these difficult events. Like mm-hmm. you're going to hit a wall, mm-hmm. right? And um, it's like there's this, you can tell they're trying to balance you know, do we push him through this Mm -hmm. because it's better for him to complete this Mm -hmm. or is this going to be detrimental if we force him to do Mm -hmm. this, you know, and it was incredible. He ended up finishing it, obviously, but like Mm -hmm. realizing, you know, they're like, you know that they want to complete this goal, Mm -hmm. but there's a little bit of cognitive impairment Mm -hmm. to have these conversations of like, remember, you Mm -hmm. wanted to do this and you want to finish it and you you wanted us to push you. And and it was incredible because it's like, Jesus, all of that's hard enough. Yeah. And now you're having to play these mental gymnastics as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I love like the openness, you know, I'm just like, he wants to give up. I'm like, you know what? I do too, dude. Like, I do too. <laughs> but dude, I'm like, this neighborhood has the good Reese's. We could stop right here. I was like, we could literally quit. <laughs> I'm like, I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> oh, I, I hate running so, so much. It's the worst. But I, I really love it though. Really? I have already signed up for here, the tradition I'm going to do is the uh, Dallas Marathon and the Fort Worth Marathon. Okay, okay. It's December and February. Yeah. So I just do like the two back to back. And um, I've completed four so far. I've oh, done wow. those. I've done those twice. Oh, wow. And I think I've kind of figured out who I am as a marathon runner now <laughs> and like what I need to do. <laughs> what your voice is. Well, like, uh, it's, God, it's similar to comedy. <laughs> like the very first one, I had no fucking clue. Yeah. And I was running um, with a, a comic, Michael Pazvar. Are you familiar with him? He's, he's a local guy, but. Him and one of his good friends, Sonny, they mm-hmm. started a group called the Juicy Joggers. Oh, I love that. And so that was the thing is like, you know, we're these guys with like dad bods and we're going to try to get out here and finish this. Yeah. And so we had this great text chain going and we're just talking shit to each other all the time. Oh, it was that's fantastic. Amazing. And so we got through that and uh-huh. we were the group where like they're pulling up the track and they're uh-huh. so like, get on the sidewalk. We have to have cars out here. <laughs> but we finished, right? Uh-huh. And then the second, third and fourth one I've done on my own. So the second one was Fort Worth and I felt like, okay, I kind of know what to expect. Yeah. And that was the one I felt the most comfortable at, where I felt like yeah. when I finished it, I was like, this was incredible. Yeah. And then the two I did this year, I changed up a lot of things. And it's like both of them were not very good performances. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I realize now it's like the training all throughout the year is going to matter. Oh, 100%. And then I need to drop weight. I have to lose weight yeah. if I'm going to get faster and better. Yeah, at these more things. aerodynamic. Yeah. <laughs> well, and just like you realize, like if I had to carry a 30 pound weight with yeah. me through the race, it would suck, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, this year 
you know, I'm really focused. Like, I just want to get good enough that I can go to areas like San Francisco and do a marathon there and also have like a vacation. And like have fun and not be like trying to like recover. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to come in on like a Friday Mm -hmm. and then run on a Sunday Mm -hmm. and then spend like four more days there with my wife and uh just enjoy the, the, you know, and not be like, I need to recover. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like I can't move. Yeah. Like, so I think I want to use marathons as a way to go vacation to these cities. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, give me an excuse to stay in shape, but also visit other parts of the country, maybe the parts of the world. Gives you like a goal. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. I can be like, Oh, I got to go to Chicago doing the marathon. Yeah, like, yeah, you know. yeah. Otherwise, you're just a crazy person paying hundreds of dollars right, to run. to suffer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it is. It is suffering. It is suffering. But and I really liked it. It's like at the finish line, I'm like, all the snacks they have, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if this was worth it. I'm like, I could have gone to the store to get a banana. <laughs> I am so slow that I still show up and like all the snacks are gone. Oh, no. I don't ever get snacks. Yeah. Oh, I get no. bottles of water, maybe a Gatorade. Oh, no. Yeah. I think my fastest time was five hours, 45 minutes. My slowest time was six hours, 30 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So my goal this year would be to break the five-hour mark. That's awesome. Uh, Dang, that's a long time to be alone with your thoughts. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. It's bad. That's another reason why I hate running. I'm like, it's too many thoughts. I think it's as torturous as doing an open mic in the Tinder one has to be, though. That's got to take you to a dark place for a moment, right? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That to me seems equally as, you know, masochistic when you start comedy. Yeah. Because there's no, you know, fame or upside or anything when you're starting that. I think I almost prefer that, though, Mm. because it's like no one has any expectation of you. Whereas I feel like, you know, if someone has seen me before and they've seen me do well, they'll be like, oh, we expect her to do well again. Interesting. And then they see me at an open mic and they were like, that was horrible. Mm-hmm. She's lost her touch. And I'm like, oh, I never had it. I just had five <laughs> minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so. The part, um, you're, the part you're in is honestly one of my favorite parts uh-huh. to watch comedy, though. Really? Yeah. Because I'm going to see you a year or two from now somewhere and yeah. it's going it, to, it will have evolved more. Yeah. And I'll get to remember where it started to the next spot. It's oh, fun. I, I hope so. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, I hope so. I think, like, honestly, like, my biggest fear in comedy, it's not that, you know, like, I won't, like, reach, like, success or anything. I'm just, like, my biggest fear is that, like, I'm just not going to get better mm. how hard I try. You know, like, I'm just, like, oh, like, what if I've, like, hit my ceiling? And I'm, like, that's a pretty low ceiling. <laughs> I think that that's a good, healthy fear uh-huh. to make sure that you keep riding and working. Yeah, yeah. You just got to hate yourself just yeah. enough. Just enough. Just enough. Literally, the last marathon I did, I hit the wall way earlier than I thought. And I was, like, on a pretty good pace. Uh I was going to do well. And um, it was, like, mile, I want to say maybe, like, 16 to mile 18. That's still considered early? Yeah, because the one before that, I didn't hit the wall till mile 20. Oh, damn. And that was kind of standard. And, I I, like, at mile mile 20, (laughs) at mile 20, I can tell myself, like, You've only got six miles, dude. You can do six miles now. Just fucking do it. But when I was at mile 14 and I'm hitting the wall again or 16 or whatever it was, um, it's like you're going into that dark place. (laughs) Yeah. You're just (laughs) like, why am I living? Having irrational thoughts, you know? Yeah. And I literally had to start telling, like I was, no one's around me. You're by yourself. There's people in front of you and kind of behind you, but you're by yourself. And I had to get in this zone of like, like I had to like, degrade myself i was like oh look at you you fucking piece of shit like yeah. i had to be like oh you've got such a hard life you ha- oh you get to pay money for marathons and then yeah. complain that they're <laughs> difficult yeah oh and and i like literally out loud i'm like oh there's somebody who like lost a leg to diabetes and you're complaining that you get to run yeah and not only did you get to you paid for it yeah oh you're so sad and pathetic you know and, and then like, got you through it. it i did that for like a mile uh-huh and then it finally started going like yeah you're right you can do this again but yeah. i had to i had to like start really insulting myself yeah of like you know oh life must be so tough for you yeah (laughs) to just like really like shame yourself oh yeah i'm sure that single mom working a double shift at taco bell is gonna love to hear about how hard the marathon was today right (laughs) exactly it's like marathons you're like you don't hear about that in third world countries like they don't do that no no and it's like could you imagine complaining to someone that has real problems yeah like I mean, around like mile 16, I got really tired. Yeah. Really tired. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, great. <laughs> they're like, cool. Yeah. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And I just saw so many people take a shit in front of my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's so interesting that you compare that to comedy because people do say they're like, comedy is a mar- like stand up is a marathon. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't 
There's no fast way. There is no fast way. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a healthy balance between like hating yourself just enough, <laughs> but also believing in yourself enough to not quit. Yeah. It's a very, very fine line. I'm amazed at any comic that holds out, you know, until they get really, really funny because there's no other way to get that funny other than just going through the motions. Yeah. What you're doing right now, finding your voice, finding what you want to talk about and what, you, you know, what's fun for you. Yeah. Right. Because you're going to hate it. So it needs to be fun. Yeah. Oh, hundred <laughs> you know? percent. Yeah. And that you can't do that in a short amount of time. No, no, not at all. And yeah, I think I think honestly, I feel like that's half the battle. I feel like the people I see who like really like make it big, it's just like, do they have like the resilience to mm. like really stick it out? But then also I see people, um, especially like in the Bay Area too, who are just like so like talented to start. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like wow, they're just like only going to get better from here. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Like, is everyone like that? But then it's like, you know, everyone's kind of on their own path. It's totally, yeah. And and, and some people plateau. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and they're all thinking the same thing. Yeah. At the end of the day, there's there's very few people that are like, I am so incredibly funny. And everyone here is lucky to be watching me. Yeah, there are people who are like that, but they're usually wrong. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, they're usually the very delusional open micers who are not funny at all. Yep. (laughs) And I love that confidence for them. (laughs) I love that. Oh my God, I went to an open mic at Hyenas. and um, Oh God, the Wednesday night one. It's brutal. Oh my God. It's bad. I signed up for it. I'm sorry, Hyenas. I shouldn't say the open mic is bad, but they get the most people that have never ever done it before yeah because it is just like such a long open mic you're almost guaranteed to get time yeah so you get the absolute beginning of comedy yeah and this woman i don't know what she talked about she got up there she was wearing like pajama pants and like an oversized t-shirt oh she she's in a bad place in life right now (laughs) and um you know she's got like the the hair's like clipped in a way that's just very convenient. It's not stylish. You know, she's having a, a, a time right mm-hmm. now. And she found comedy, I guess. And yeah. This is, you know, and this so, is her God. And I'm always so supportive. Like, I want to laugh so hard. I'm like trying to be engaged and yeah. be like half smile. Like, bring it home. I don't know what she was talking about. She was ranting about some story. And then, you know, she ran the light and, uh, the host is like walking up onto the stage and she's like, is that it? That's my time. And he's like, yeah, let's get a hand for so-and-so. Yeah. And then she just kind of breaks down and she's like looking at the crowd. She's like, were y'all even listening to anything I said? And you're like, we were it listening. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and then it turned into like, if I just like, if you just give me more time and it's, <laughs> and it's like, she just, truly believes that for she herself. Believed it. Like we, and then as she got off, she's talking to whoever she came there with about like, you know, they just don't fucking get it and blah, blah, blah. Like, she's still going on. Like, wow. the crowd was the problem. She was super funny. We didn't get it. And wow. It's like, I need some of that confidence. I know. I'm like, if I could have an ounce of that confidence, how much happier would I be? Right? But I would be more delusional for sure. Yeah, but ignorance is bliss, right? If you're it a little is. delusional, you probably yeah. got a great life. Yeah. In your mind, it's great. Exactly, exactly. I'm like, what's it like to live like that? She has probably moved on to something totally different now. And yeah. then she tells stories about like, you know, I was pretty great at comedy, but it just wasn't for me. Yeah, like, that era is over. <laughs> I put the mic down. Yeah. And she didn't, though. She got it taken <laughs> away from her. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, what's been your favorite part about this two-year journey so far? What uh, have you enjoyed the most about it? Maybe that you didn't even expect, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... I mean, I think this sounds kind of obvious, but I think like the biggest thing is like really being able to like being encouraged to like be myself. And Mm -hmm. I know we've talked a lot about like, you know, still trying to like find my voice and figure out who I am. But I feel like for like most of my life, like I've really tried to like fit like a certain like mold. And this is like the first time where like being different is like encouraged Mm -hmm. and I've always felt like I've had like weird outlooks on things and I'm like oh this is actually like good for me now yeah um and I think I think it's really cool to like kind of like be doing something where you know like I feel like I can really like express that um Mm -hmm. and people will listen had Um, you had an outlet like that before you did comedy no, not at all. Is this no, kind of I the just first, bottled it up inside. Is this kind of the first artistic endeavor? Um, I guess. I mean, like I played piano growing up. Okay, yeah. So um, you're an artist then. It was silent and it was <laughs> What do you mean it was silent? <laughs> I didn't say I had no like expression, you know, cuz I was just like following the motions. Like mm. there wasn't really like any like heart or like like no into improvisation it. with your piano. You were just oh, playing absolutely. what's there. Oh, absolutely. I was like just playing by the books mm. and I was like this is 
this is good for something. Yeah. <laughs> this makes me smarter somehow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you play still? No, not at all. You, not at all. If it you was, see a piano, do you even want to touch it? I would. I just don't remember anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like one of those things where like my parents made me do it growing yeah. up and they were like, it'll be good for Very you. Very Taiwanese yeah. thing, right? Yeah, and I was like, it will be good for me. Mm-hmm. It made me a fast typer, so. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My elementary school teacher saw me typing once. She's like, you'll be a great secretary one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks. Hey, there's still time to prove her right. You know? I know, like, right? I'm like, mm, <laughs> my hundred words per minute. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I do think, though, learning the piano, you, uh, I play guitar, and, yeah. but I think there's something with music. I think piano especially. I've always wanted to uh, learn piano, and there's been a couple times in my life where I've you know, gone to like take lessons or learn yeah. it. But it's, I forgot how long it took me to learn guitar to uh-huh. where I felt like I was really good at it. Yeah. And you know, now that I can just play guitar... I think I get more frustrated because I have to remind myself, like, you don't know anything about this instrument. It's going yeah. to take years. Yeah. You know, and you're going to have to commit years. But I think piano players, I think y'all have some connections in your brain that other people just don't have. Oh, I don't know. I think you do. <laughs> I think it's in there because it's to play a piano somewhat effortlessly yeah. it takes a lot of skill. Yeah, I think it's all a facade too. You what do you to, mean? You have to make it look like it's Don't not ruin this hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do also think like piano is really like any other thing where like if you just try hard enough, like mm. you can, you can get it. You know, you can get to a certain place. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think you have to love it on somewhat of a deep level to to be good at it because it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely aspects about it that's interesting, but yeah, it was never like my passion or anything, mm. but I kind of reckon it kind of felt like a vitamin, you know? I was like this oh. is strengthening my brain somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, See, I'm the opposite. If I hear something that's a really beautiful piano piece, like mm-hmm. that's one of the few instruments that really move me. Wow. You know what I mean? Like I can hear amazing guitar parts, amazing songs or whatever. But like yeah. I'll follow I'll follow people on Instagram who are just phenomenal at piano. Uh-huh. And it'll be somebody who's, you know, probably very formally trained. Yeah. But they're just playing in their living room. Right. And they'll do either covers or just pieces of, you know, classical music or whatever they're playing. And uh, you know, when it's done really well, there's mm-hmm. something about a piano, I think, that's just very Yeah. You know. Even in uh like pop culture it's pop music you know how many times have you had whatever genre of music like hip-hop rock music and they're like do you hear that one song they added a piano and it'll be the yeah. easiest piano thing that's ever existed but everybody freaks out and, and they're, they're like it's like, so deep yeah <laughs> you're like dang those keys oh the my black gosh. and white keys they did four chords yeah on piano though yeah fucking incredible i mean it is a really cool thing yeah, yeah definitely think about the first person who made a piano yeah. Like a piano's crazy if you think about the way yeah. it works. I mean, what came before the piano? Like I the don't know. organ, maybe? I have a favorite piano piece, but I forget who, oh. who plays it. But um Can you sing it? Uh no. <laughs> yeah, I can sing it. Okay. You ready? Yeah, Here's yeah, how it yeah. goes. It's like ten minutes of silence. Oh. <laughs> I swear to God. What? I'll send it to you online. Okay. There's a, I don't remember who the composer was, but you perform it live, mm-hmm. and there's literally, like they sit down with the music uh-huh. with no notes on it, uh-huh. and there's like a timer, and uh-huh. you go through a certain amount of time, and then you turn a page, yeah. and you go through a certain amount of time, and it's the like pretentiousness of music where um, yeah. whoever created it was like, well, you know, if you do it live, it's like there's always going to be like a shuffle in the seat or like a cough yeah. in the crowd and the piece is different every time. Or you the hear music it. in your own head, sure. your thoughts. Sure, and it's just like, <laughs> no, you're sitting there not playing. Yeah. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> That's hilarious. That <laughs> is hilarious. Absolutely. Love. I'll find the piece because people, um, people will perform that piece today. Oh my God, that's you know, hilarious. Like you'll go to a recital and someone's like, I'm performing, you know, whatever it's called by this person. Yeah. And it, like I think one of them, they did it with a stopwatch. So you literally hear like, beep. Like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so so you know you're turning the page at the right moment. I guess so. Yeah. yeah it's so that's fucking That's insane. Dumb. I think that's my favorite piece ever. Yeah, it, that's so funny. And then funny. there was another one where um, you, uh, you light the piano on fire. Oh, okay. That's an expensive yeah. performance. <laughs> and the idea is like, you know, the strings melt and pop and the, the soundboard or whatever breaks at some point. And there's all these noises and it's like, it's so experimental. I, and it's I hope like, it's not a Steinway. Yeah, right. It's like, can we just play it? Can you just yeah. hit the keys, please? Yeah, I hope it's a cheap piano. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> that's insane. Yeah. That's hilarious. It so. seems like something I would watch in San Francisco. That's what. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm like I wouldn't pa- I wouldn't put it past someone in San Francisco to do that for sure. <laughs> what has been the craziest thing that you've seen in the city, but you you were like cool with it, like you liked it? Comedy wise, or just no, no, no like just anything city. living there where you're just like, huh, that's fucking weird. But you were down with it. It was fine. It was interesting. Because huh. when you live there, you forget that it's yeah. it's that way, you know. Yeah. Oh, I think um, there's this guy at this park kind of close to where I used to live, and he would just be naked, <laughs> but with just a sock over his private Oh, so parts. not naked then. He was covered. But he would like, it wasn't that just that. He would like do yoga by himself with his dog. Yeah. Okay. It was so, in, so this is not a homeless person. It is this not is, a, this is a housed person. This was actually at the park um across from the Painted Ladies. The, yeah. Um so it was beautiful park, tons of tourists and then just Great place hip. to do some yoga. Yeah, 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 and he was he was fully almost nude. But that's the key point. Almost nude. Almost nude, but it was just like the the courage with which he was really just dancing and then doing yoga. Mm -hmm. He was like leaping over his dog. What age are we talking? What age range? Uh, 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s? Oh, no, like 50s to 60s. 50s to 60s. Yeah, Yeah, he was very spry. That's the age where men can get really confident for no reason. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it's after your midlife crisis, you stop really giving a shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, resurgence. Were you offended by it or were you like, good for you? I, I was just, I was impressed by it, honestly. <laughs> I was just, again, I was, it was one of those things where I was like, I wish I had an ounce of that confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, but what are you going to put the sock on? You know, that's just, you know, yeah, I know. I'm like, I'm like, when I'm at you'll the, never, you'll never be able to have that moment. Yeah. When I'm at the gym and I like my towel slips from the shower, I'm like, I'm so sorry I'm so to like sorry. everyone around me. I'm like, I'm so sorry. You had to see the same thing that you also have. You yeah. know, I think I would absolutely love walking down the street, seeing somebody doing that in a park. Yeah. I would love that. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this makes sense. Like if you're not, bo- like if you're not running up at people and bothering them, it's yeah. like, Hey, you're just yeah. trying to get some sun, man. I yeah, get it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know what? Vitamin D is great for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've had so much fun chatting oh gosh, with that's you. So much fun, Travis. Getting to know you. Um, so you said for sure you typically come back in the winter to see your family. Yes, I always come back in December, usually for like a month okay. or so, so. So that's probably the next time I'll get to watch you. Then yeah, around town. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'll have some new jokes for you then. Hopefully about snacks. Uh, I just want you to talk about whatever you enjoy talking about because <laughs> I want to see, like, I want to see you. Um, like what you consider to be the like unhinged version of yeah. like I'm just going to talk about what I like and go with. It. I love how my version of unhinged is talking about snacking, absolutely, and yeah. grocery stores, snacking, and I'm not great at driving. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, where do you like people to follow you so that when you come back to town? Um, yeah, yeah, you follow me on Instagram at real Denise Lee. Um, I usually post all my shows on my story. Um, I'll make posts. Uh, so yeah. And then where are you back. usually performing in San Francisco? Um, just all over all over uh usually uh yeah your favorite dive bar in town okay, cool. i'm there okay awesome. um but yeah yeah it's all on instagram if anyone's ever in town um definitely hit me up we'd awesome. love to see you at a show thank you so much yeah thank you for having me the i'm a fan of podcast music comedy and more